and welcome to another episode of Do Go On. My name is David Warnicky, and as always, I'm here with Matt Stewart and Jess Perkins. Hello, David. Hello, hey. Matt. I wasn't done singing. It hey. is my favorite time of the week. It's time to record a podcast <laughs> with my friends. I <laughs> love it. I did not know. I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, there is actually a trumpet solo, Matt, if you could yeah. pipe down. I didn't know you played. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you, you. So you can play the trumpet whilst miming a trombone. That's very impressive. Yeah, <laughs> I'm pretty clever. Uh, well, isn't it nice to be alive? Even more so after that beautiful rendition of that uh, an original track? An original, yes. What's it original? Yeah. Off straight from the top of my dome. Improvised. Yeah, I've got no idea what I said. Wow. And there's no way for me to listen back to it and find out and replicate it in the future. Jess, so. can I say this to you? Please. Happy block. Oh, and to you, Dave, you look well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Happy and there's block. Nothing, there's nothing colder than a compliment. <laughs> Dave, yeah. and I, Dave and I have recently broken up <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we're keeping it civil for the listeners, That's aka right. our children. <laughs> <laughs> I've started with a weird energy. I'm putting them first. I'm sorry. Yeah, you must. <laughs> You're putting our listeners first. Before my children. <laughs> okay. My oh. unborn children. Oh, wow. That's right, everyone. How far along are That's they? full on. <laughs> Some of them are like 80. Really? This is a very bizarre start to this what episode. What a strange podcast. For new is. listeners, before they turn off, I'd love to explain <laughs> to you how this works. So one of the three of us uh, goes away and researches a topic, often from history, well, I guess they're all from history, <laughs> one uh, way or another. Yeah. It's all stuff that's happened. Yeah. Some um, of it recent history, some of it very ancient. Exactly. And then we bring that research back and, and in the form of basically like an old school report mm. and we do an oral presentation to the other two. They listen, sometimes, uh, you know, take it for a little walk, go yep. on some tangents, yep. take it for frustrate, a... frustrate new listeners. Yeah, like, we frustrate Stick them. to the topic. Yeah. Stop <laughs> frustrating me. Oh, I'm so frustrated. All your interruptions are frustrating. <laughs> All right, I, I, I think uh, I thought I'm going to jump in. I reckon I can explain it this week. It turned out I couldn't. Jess, can you explain block though for people? Block, absolutely. It is blockbuster Topher Grace month. There was something, there's another Period. word in there. Period. Um, it is uh, Blocktober. It is our blockbuster month, which we've now sort of turned into two months. We use October <laughs> and November to uh, bring you our most requested topics. Our Patreons get to vote as well. And these are the no, top. Everyone gets to vote. Everyone gets to this vote. This is a public yeah, vote. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, I forgot that. Um, thousands and thousands of voters. So many votes. They've spoken about the topics they wanted to hear for this most sacred time of year. That's right. Um, so we are doing our top nine most requested and voted on topics. It's huge. We've had some pretty big blocks and uh, this one, no different. Yeah, some people are saying the biggest block ever. Some people are saying that. I have taken that very literally this I've, week. I've been just... <laughs> Around, oh, no. the, around the around um, the the streets and stuff, I yeah. just you know I'm not listening in to people, but I just can't help but notice hearing the question asked a lot. Well, what are you doing for block? Yeah, this year? there's a buzz, isn't there? There's is a real buzz. Yeah, but Dave, you're you're doing the seventh most voted for topic of our blockbuster topics, our most requested topics, uh, and. Yeah, we normally get on to the topic with a question. Dave, do you have a question for us today? Here we go. My question is. <clears throat> Houston, we have a problem, is a punched up Hollywood misquote from what real life space disaster? Oh, that's a Hollywood punched up requote. Well, I reckon I heard it in Tom Hanks's film. Apollo 13. Big. <laughs> oh. I just, want, I just wanted to get the point. Is that what he said when he fell over on that giant piano? <laughs> <laughs> we got a problem here. Oh, I'm being Houston. electrocuted. Houston. Oh, Houston. The store manager's name was Houston. He had to come over and help him. Why does that child know a store manager by name <laughs> it's a confusing dynamic i come here too often i know the manager sorry matt i jumped on your joke there um or your very real answer i'm not sure um <laughs> because i was desperate to get the point because i just, felt like i actually knew the answer for once you are correct you do get the point it is apollo 13 did the I, apollo 13 space disaster is my report this week did i almost say apollo 11 yeah we've wow. already I'm, done that haven't i we? know i wonder if he's going to talk about apollo 12 the missing link. I so. will talk about <gasps> Apollo 12. Hooray! The missing link because... That is, that's one that isn't talked about. Well, well until, until now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this topic, though, Apollo 13, not Apollo 12, has been suggested by a bunch of people. And thank you to Adam Derbyshire, Sarah Groom, Ben, William Young, Kat, Antonia Daly, Jared Brazel, 
Frazzle dazzle. Oh, Jesus, just so good. good. It's uh, Brazil, pronounced like frazzle with a B, he said. Thank you so much, Jared. Anytime you've got a name, you think I might stuff up. Love that. Love it. Uh, Andrew Mallard, Oliver Wardle. Like a duck. Oliver Wardle. 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 Great. Oh, oh. That's an adorable name. That's so cute. It's like Waddle. <laughs> so good. We've got Claire, Kirsten Gleason, Alicia or Alicia Moore, in brackets, Lish, Peter Holberton, mm-hmm. and that's it. Thank wow. you so I think I think Wardle's the surname of the guy who invented Wordle. Wardle? Yeah. I love it. I've also never really thought about how Waddle is um what's it what's the what's like it called? Like a duck. What's it called <laughs> when a word sounds like what it is? Onomatopoeia. Thank you. I thought it was and I, I took myself out of it. Don't you think waddle? So mm. like waddle, 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 waddle. Waddle, 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 waddle. <laughs> That's cute. Waddling is cute. Waddle, is there waddle, another waddle, word waddle. for that where it's like it's not quite a sound, but it, it it's, it's just a, it's so apt, like dawdling as, as well. You know, you're yeah, dawdling along. Yeah. A very descriptive word. It's so good. It sounds like it's action. I love that. Have words. a dawdle. Have a dawdle. <laughs> well, let me give you a bit of background on the Apollo missions because it's been a long time since we've talked about Apollo 11, mm. which I believe I talked about way back on episode 7. Oh, wow. Are you serious? God, we started big, didn't we? Is that a coincidence? This is the seventh most <gasps> most requested topic. You did it on episode seven. Yeah, the seventh one. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny because if it's anybody else, you just let it go. But when it's you, I'm like, oh, I'm going to fucking get you. <laughs> I'm going to roast this prick. <laughs> <laughs> you had it good, too good if for too long. Anybody else says it, I'm like, I completely understood what they were saying there. Unless they've like comp- used the completely wrong word or something and it's it gives us a whole new meaning. I'll let it go. With you, any tiny <laughs> mess up and I'm like, oh, you think you got away with that prick? <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, huh? Now I've, I've already forgotten what you said but I'm like a Seven. fucking got him. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I talked about that in December 2015. Can you believe it? Wow. wow. I think this is my third because I also did the uh, Challenger Space Disaster. Yeah. So just the way the block photos worked out that I'm doing Isn't the space funny? one. You're our space guy. I love space. Space, man. man. I mean, do you have a planet tattooed on you? Yes. Oh. Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> it's like what? No, it just genuinely does have. I do have Saturn. Saturn. Because it's, it's, it's my favorite because it's got bling. <laughs> yeah. And she has it tattooed. On her anus. <laughs> no, it's your anus. I have She's that got tattooed on my anus. <laughs> anus. Matching. <laughs> matching. Isn't hers. <laughs> Isn't hers anuses. <laughs> Matt's is bigger. <laughs> Tattoo. Tattoo. Yeah. Of course. It's to scale <laughs> on the butt. Okay, background on Apollo. In May 1961, another former topic, President John F. Kennedy committed America to landing astronauts on the moon by 1970. It was called the Apollo Program. And it was the third United States human space flight program carried up, carried out by NASA. Uncrewed missions testing Apollo and the powerful Saturn V rocket that would blast astronauts to the moon began in February 1966, a year in which nothing else happened. Nothing else happened. It was a big year for that and that alone. No, I think Tony Lockett, the plugger, the greatest ever goal kicker in AFL, VFL history, was born that year. And he oh. went on to play for the Saints, who won their one and only oh, premiership. Damn it. God, he's good. In the year 1966. Oh, I'll pay that. that Chicago well Bulls also formed that year. Uh, England won the World Cup. A few things happened. Hmm. Hey, Jess, you weren't joking when you said you always have a go at me for mispronouncing things, but Dave just said NASA, not NASA. Oh, my God. That is embarrassing, actually. And you just let it slide. Yeah. I'm, I'm embarrassed. God, will... you're an idiot, And I'm going to double down and continue to pronounce it wrong yes. the entire episode. Yeah, <laughs> just cute. to lean into the joke. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. right. To yeah. own my mistake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not to humour an old man. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so Apollo 1 is where it started, ah. well, which was only named in retrospect, actually. It was the first crewed mission of the Apollo program with the plan. It's a bit dirty. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> You should have seen what they were doing to that thing. <laughs> All the down the side, cock and balls were drawn. Yeah. <laughs> mm, a bit crude. <laughs> uh, with the plan to orbit Earth. But unfortunately, a tragedy struck when a cabin fire during a launch rehearsal killed all three astronauts, <gasps> Gus Grissom, Ed White, and pilot Roger B. Chaffee. Oh, oh my God. Roger three B. brilliant Chaffee. names. Um, so it was a rehearsal. Yes, and unfortunately, because at the time they were operating in a pure oxygen atmosphere inside there and then there was a spark. Oh. It caught extremely hot fire and they couldn't open the, oh. the oh, capsule door. That's awful. And uh, Because it was so hot in there. Just and it was instant death, hopefully. Uh, the amazing thing about these guys is, and I always find this so impressive, 
they the positions they found them in when they fa- got the bodies out minutes later and they were incinerated was um one of them was still sitting in the chair on the radio as protocol calls for and the other two were trying to open the hatch holy shit but imagine like you are on fire but you're still doing yeah. the protocol Following like protocol, you're not panicking yeah. you're just going okay i've got to do this and they know oh my god we can't get out of here and wow they died of smoke inhalation or that's awful. carbon monoxide poisoning but absolutely horrific stuff but i'm also impressed that these people can stay calm in no matter what the situation mm. yeah. is yeah and i know we have pretty strict podcasting protocols yeah but i want you to know if there's even I was going to say an emergency, but not even. Just yeah. something more interesting. Bit of a hassle. I'm out. I'm out that door. You're on your own, suckers. That is the protocol, though. So That's I'm protocol. actually yeah. following protocol. Get out first. <laughs> <laughs> the protocol. <laughs> you yell protocol <laughs> as you're pushing Matt out the way. Excuse me, just out first. <laughs> pushing protocol. Me, pushing Matt into the fire. <laughs> it's what he would have wanted. That's what Jess, she said anything interesting. And she finds fire very interesting. Yeah. I love it. Uh, and of course, I meant I did mean to say hatch instead of door for anyone who is really into space. Oh, uh, I don't <laughs> actually have doors. <laughs> could, yeah, one of the problems is that it opened inwards, and right. because of the pressure of the fire, they couldn't open. It wouldn't open. Is that oh. something they went to? They changed. They fixed in that future? Yes. Okay, no great. longer was it a pure oxygen atmosphere, and then they also made it so the door could open. Okay, great. Hatch. Can you give us their names one more time? They were fantastic. Gus Grissom. And he's he's quite a, he's a very famous astronaut. Right he's off really the bat. Good, yeah. so, so good. So good. Ed White. Okay. Roger B. Chaffee. Oh, oh my God. I mean, Ed Rog. White Ed White in the company, the other two, I think. Yeah. It's great. Because you gotta every every trio's gotta have a You gotta have a just, Michael Collins. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so in retrospect, they named that test Apollo 1 in tribute to these three men. Okay. So that's why that's considered Apollo 1 at the time. They didn't know that. The mission was grounded for 20 months and Apollo continued with Apollo 4, 5 and 6, which were all unmanned. In October 1968, Apollo 7 was the first crewed flight in NASA's Apollo program. A crew of three made a 163 orbit flight. It was a mission filled with bickering between the astronauts on board and the crew on, gra- on the ground over the procedures and I believe the three men inside never flew again. Because oh, wow. of all the bickering. They had a big fight. Wow. So they never flew again because they were not allowed to fly again or because they were like, I'm done with that. I believe the commander had said beforehand, this is my last flight, which is okay. also why he was a bit of, I don't give a shit. Yeah. They were saying he didn't want to wear his helmet on the way back in as they landed because he had a sinus infection and he thought the pressure would make his eardrums explode. Oh, shit. And they said, no, you have to wear the helmet. But him and the three and his two other people didn't. Because he said, I'm the commander. My word is final. What? Yeah, I can right. overrule them. And they later said, okay, you're right. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, w- it would have exploded his eardrums. Well, I think they were more like, you have the right to. Yeah, wear it or not. You're up it. there. It's your health. It sort of <laughs> reminds me a shit. bit of um, Alistair Lynch's last AFL game. It was in a grand final and he was retiring. So he knew at the end of the game, whatever happened, he was out. So he just went out swinging. He's like throwing haymakers. <laughs> At uh, Daryl Wakelin, who he was playing on, <laughs> and like got this long suspension, but he was retiring. Oh no, he suspended me. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that oh, no. sucks. Oh, I can't play for five games. Good. That's fun. That'll again. That'll be me. Last podcast. Yes. I'm fucking decking. All bets both are of off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna finally wedgie Dave. <laughs> Uh, that guy I was talking about, that was Walter Skira, and he was the first person astronaut to go into space three times. Wow. And the only astronaut to have flown in the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo program. So I guess that's why he's like, I know what I'm talking, I know about. What I'm talking yeah. about. Cool. Badass. And that's some cool. Poindexter back at, in Houston's trying to tell him what to do. Um, actually, put your helmet on. <laughs> <laughs> um, protocol states. <laughs> um, actually, if you have a look at subsection B. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, um, like nerd. how about I don't want my head to explode? <laughs> yeah. that? Uh, <laughs> it's my impression of nerds. Great. Spot on. Sounded just like Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then there was Apollo 8, followed in December 1968. That was the first crewed spacecraft to leave low Earth orbit and the first human spaceflight to reach the moon. All I can hear now is crude. Mm. Me too. I say it every time now. That was the first. Uh, so it crude- made it to the moon. Made it to the moon. The crew orbited the moon 10 times without landing. The crew included a man by the name of James Lovell. And we'll talk about him a lot on this episode. That name rings a bell. James Lovell. I don't know. I'm sure I knew this somewhere deep in my 
brain. But I don't think I knew that other people had gotten to the moon, just not landed on it. Mm. So they they made, so that. But I suppose mm. like it would be pretty ambitious to be like, all right, first go, let's land, land on it, yes. walk on it. That's this whole thing yeah. is a build up to be the first yeah. to land on the moon because they're very much at this time competing against the Soviets. And they think the Soviets have the jump on them. Yeah. It's looking likely that they're going to do it first. And was so, um, was it always planned to be number 11 was going to be the first one where they landed on the moon? Or I believe so, yeah. yes. I think it's, it's basically, we'll get there. We'll go around it. We'll spend a bit longer there. So, so, these so guys everything's orbited. going to plan, basically. Yep. They, they orbited so Armstrong could moonwalk. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They, Roy, orbited. <laughs> so, I don't know. <laughs> Crying. <laughs> I, yeah, I guess that totally makes sense. I don't know why in my head I was like, they just had a crack. They just went and they landed and they walked on it and it was great. I think that's because uh, sometimes I can be a little impulsive. Mm. <laughs> well, I'm like, ah, give it a go. Oh, you know whatever. Michael Collins, that's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah, James Lovell, who we'll talk about, apparently he was he was like, when they were orbiting, we're so close. Yeah. Can just you basically touch it. Let's give it a crack. Let's get down there. Yeah, that would be frustrating. Yeah. I mean, we've come this far. Yeah. Uh, in March 1969, nice, Apollo 9 became the first flight of the full Apollo spacecraft, including the command and service module. Of the full Apollo spacecraft. <laughs> no, don't try. Sorry, mate. I want to be I want to be a bitch. <laughs> you can't. Oh. You're either born a bitch <laughs> or, or you die a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is that a threat? <laughs> What's it going to be? <laughs> I'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> what about you're either born a bitch or you're Jess's bitch. Oh, no. Oh. No, I don't like that. This okay. kid has got claws. I'm nice. Sometimes. <laughs> Except when Matt mispronounces something and then, then that prick. Oh, you son of a bitch, I gotcha. So, yeah, Apollo 9, it had the command service module and the lunar module. So they're getting close, which is the thing that's eventually that going to land moon. on the moon. They're getting closer and closer and they carried out many tests critical to a land, landing a person on the moon's surface. Then there was Apollo 10 launched in May 1969 and it was described by NASA as a dress rehearsal for the moon landing. Mm. This was the second crew to orbit the moon. And finally, July 1969, you're right. July 1969, Apollo 11 with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins was, of course, the first crew to land and walk on the moon, as I previously spoke about on episode seven. Go back and give it a listen. Then come back crack. to this one and then be like, wow, they sound so much better now. And that's mm. not, I'm not even complimenting ourselves there. I'm just saying we used to sound shit. Because of the mic setup and that. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. It was nothing to do with us. Yeah, we've got a much better setup now. Yeah. Yeah, we've got solid walls on our pod studio. Yeah. Back Can't then. hear Auntie Donna rehearsing downstairs. Yeah. Two of the walls were curtains. <laughs> that's right. They were, we were in a curtained off area. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one wall was, was it like, a joint wall with a meatpacking plant or something. Yeah, that's right. Beautiful for sound quality. <laughs> then there's Apollo 12, November 1969, which would have attempted the first lunar landing had Apollo 11 failed. So that was the backup. They had no idea if it was going to work, really. Yeah. Well, they hoped for the best. But after the success of Neil Armstrong's mission, Apollo 12 was postponed by two months and other Apollo missions also put on a more relaxed schedule. Just chill. We've like done we it. it. Yeah, because they had they they basically had them coming up every few months. Just we'll keep going until we get there. We've and then clocked they, to the moon. They got there the first time they they wanted to do wow. it. And they're like, oh, great. That is impressive. Yeah. Uh, Apollo 12, despite <laughs> being struck by lightning twice after launch, which caused a power surge that knocked all three fuel cells offline, instruments began to malfunction and telemetry data began to be garbled. Oh, that's another one. Garble. 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 Which it's a word that keeps coming up in the you know what does it space mean? world. So like muddled. Muddled, like and on the radio you you're garbled if they can't understand what you're saying. Like there's transcripts oh, right. of all this stuff and it says Neil garble. Armstrong garble, garbled. Garble. Garble garble. No one can work out what Sounds he's saying. Like he's a bloody turkey. Yeah. <laughs> Neil. On the ground they couldn't track the data of the craft, and on board they had no power at all, and they were running on battery power. And that wasn't enough to complete the launch. So it's looking real risky on takeoff. Flight director Jerry Griffin expected that he would have to abort the mission. However, one NASA engineer and flight controller had seen this obscure occurrence before one year earlier. He'd seen similar weird telemetry readings and traced the anomaly in his own time. Afterwards, he'd gone, oh, do you know, troubleshoot this problem. I'll hmm. have a look. He went, found it in the obscure signal conditioning electronic system, the SCE. He was one of the few people in the world who had any recognition of this. 
A year earlier, he'd worked out that normal readings could be restored by putting the SCE on its auxiliary setting, which meant that it would operate even with low voltage conditions, even with low power. His name is John Aaron. John Aaron. And to quote from the NASA fandom page, that's how much of uh, people like this guy, Aaron surmised that this setting would also return the Apollo 12 telemetry to normal. And this is all happening within seconds. Like mm. They're panicking going, do I abort, do I abort? They've got like a few seconds to make the decision. When he made the recommendation to the flight director, he said, flight, try SCE to AUKS. Most of his mission c- control colleagues had no idea what he was even talking about. Both the flight director and the Capcom asked him to repeat the recommendation. Peter Conrad's, the comms response to the order was, what the hell is that? <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Put the SE, try SE to orcs. They're like, what the fuck does that mean? Have you ever in a, like a situation, maybe a meeting or something, and um, so people are throwing in some suggestions and then you're like, oh, this, look at this wild idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I don't know, they've got a problem. I don't really know, but it's, I'd feel silly if I don't just have a go. Yeah. And then you say something, they're like, Oh no! I no. Don't, don't really understand. What the hell what is that? that? <laughs> what the hell is I will, I'd love it if this guy they they, they tried. It's like no, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. no. thanks, Aaron. <laughs> oh, like the, ro- the rocket explodes. <laughs> yeah. Fucking hell, Aaron. <laughs> He's like, oh, I didn't say it would work. Just get it a crash. I just thought I thought I'd feel silly. I'll if... just throw it out. Ideas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just chuck us the aux cable. I what? would love to have a meeting with you guys and suggest something and have you both go, what the hell? <laughs> what the hell is that? I don't know if this is a memory of mine or if it's like a sketch from, what's that, <laughs> that um, I think you should leave. It feels like a sketch on that <laughs> where he like throws in some ridiculous <laughs> yeah, suggestion. Yeah. So, My life is very similar to that show. Is it? Yeah. And then people <laughs> tell you you should leave? Yeah, I once crashed a hot dog car. <laughs> <and> <laughs> a, a okay, store. that could have been anyone. <laughs> That's true. I should, yeah, I should say it. Not necessarily. <laughs> I was there when it happened, I mean. Uh, Peter Conrad is like, what the hell is that? But he goes, all right, let's try it. Fortunately, Alan Bean, one of the astronauts on board, was familiar with the location of the SCE switch. Inside the capsule, he flipped it to auxiliary. Telemetry was immediately restored, allowing the mission to continue. Wow. This earned John Aaron the lasting respect of his colleagues who declared that he was, quote, a steely-eyed missile man. <laughs> So good. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And that's a compliment in their world. Oh, he's a steely eyed missile man. Having major deja vu about that. Steely eyed missile. Really? <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the movie of this Apollo 13? Have you guys seen that movie? I saw it for my birthday. Fucking hell. Here he goes. I can't. Uh, was it Southland? And I think. Okay. Who was there? <laughs> uh, I, was, I saw it with James Wright. Yep. And uh, Jonathan. I don't remember his surname. Okay. Kids from school. Yeah. Is this like your a young youngish birthday? Yeah. Would have been like eighth or seventh or something. Right. It's a pretty full on movie for for kids. As we're going to find out the story, I, I was just wondering if you've seen it because in the movie I noticed in the script because I wrote my report and then I hadn't seen the movie and I was like, I watched it last night. Really enjoyed it. It's a fantastic movie. But um, someone else is called a steely eyed missile man and I'm like, ha! Huh! I know what that's referencing. Even though John Aaron's in the movie, they are calling someone else that. Oh. That's bullshit. Come on, Aaron's the Steely Eyed Missile Man, according to NASA fandom. Normally, I prefer a shorter nickname, but Steely Eyed Missile Man. Yeah, yeah, that's because that's good. still catchy. Yeah, well, you, I love you could, it. Well, how would you shorten it? You just shorten Steely it to Missile Eyed Missile What's Man. The steel? Stem. Steely Dan. Stem. Stem. It's good to finally have a man in stem. Thank God. <laughs> finally, uh, basically, because of John Aaron, who at the time was only twenty-five or twenty-six years old. Wow. They made it and three more men made it to the moon, two walking on its surface. Isn't it um, always impressive when somebody, like you hear the age of somebody like that and you're like, 25, working at the bloody NASA. Oh, okay, no. And then yeah. you realise that there are just like people out there who are impressive and have skills and yeah. abilities. Yeah, that's They're like, prodigies. And like, no, yeah. like I, think that, I think just like 25-year-olds can just have a job and be good at it. That's what, what I mean. That's ridiculous. That's crazy. There's just people like that out there. I was there, still you know? a trolley boy when I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with some that. Some people work at NASA, some people were trolley boys. We've all got jobs. Yeah, I don't know. there's no job. You know, we I need... also worked in the liquor department. If yeah. there were no Sorry. trolley boys, but how, where would we get our trolleys? Like where, every exactly. job is important. Where would John Aaron from NASA shop without the trolley boy? Yeah, well, he's got to carry all his groceries. <laughs> he's John Aaron from NASA. Yeah. yeah. Do you he's think got... he's got time to collect a he trolley? He doesn't have time. No. Do you think he has time to... Stack his own liquor shelves? Surely not. Uh, we're going to talk more about John Aaron with today's main topic that we finally arrived at, which is Apollo 13. A good lucky number. 
Exactly. Now, the thing that blasts them to the moon, or for, for takeoff at least, is the... A rocket. Giant, exactly. The Saturn V, most powerful rocket ever made. Wish Still? I could watch one take off. Yes, extreme, wow. huge, ridiculous. Makes wow. the, so makes rocket the, technology hasn't really come on. Well, I think Because I talk about the computers on board are less powerful than a calculator or something. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> well, uh, but the rocket is still the most powerful ever. That's interesting. Well, maybe we're underestimating calculators. <gasps> oh, that's a, such Thought a about good that? point. That is such a good point. <laughs> wow. So NASA had contracted for 15 Saturn V rockets t- to achieve the goal of landing a person on the moon. They had no idea how many missions it would take to achieve the goal. And when they ended up doing so in 1969, they'd used six rockets. Wow. So they'd got nine rockets remaining they hoped to use for further moon landings. They're like, well, we got them. It's good to buy in bulk. We paid for them exactly. They essentially went to Costco for yeah. rockets. Use them or lose them because they'd go out of date. They're basically like milk. I yeah. Mean. Yeah. I reckon they're pasteurized, aren't they, rockets? Yeah. <laughs> I think Louis was on. Um, Homogenized? Louis Pasteur was involved there yeah, somewhere. Yeah, 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 in rockets. Apollo 13's Latin motto. Oh, here you go, Matt. You'll know this. Fortio, fortius <laughs> quo fidelius? Fidelius? He does every time. Every time, and you never get it right. <laughs> well, you're never sure. No, that's right. I remember because I said it one time and someone laughed very hard at me because I always thought it was because this is the St. Kilda Football Club's yes. motto. It means strength through loyalty. Fidelius, but it's like, yeah, I have no idea now. Fortius, it's not, and it's not, I don't think any part of it I say right. (laughs) Fortius, maybe the quo. (laughs) Quo? Fortius quo fidelius. Whatever. Sounds good. What's this one's Latin? Uh, The the mission motto in Latin was ex luna scientia, which means. Moon. Yes, from the moon, knowledge. Oh. Ooh. Geez, they just skipped to knowledge. Yeah, from the moon. Comma, knowledge. <laughs> From the moon, knowledge. No. <laughs> How beautiful is uh, the language that they can just use three words mm. but say so much. Yeah. So much. For us, we'd say from the moon, we'll, we'll gain, get some knowledge, yeah. we'll gain some knowledge. But they just say from the moon. And knowledge. even that like from the moon kind of implies that we're like asking the moon some yeah. stuff. So I think we would probably say like from our travels to the moon yes. and studying its surface and <laughs> and climate and, you know, um, I, I don't know, other stuff. And Gosh. then in brackets you'd say one slash question mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we don't know how many. Don't know how many tweets. tweets is gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> from that we will hopefully gain some knowledge. So Lu- That's what we, I would say. Yeah, that's what I'd say. Luna is... Muna. Is, is Luna uh, Latin? Lunary Muna. I didn't realise Luna was Latin. Huh? Makes you think. It does, doesn't it? Because it mean, it's backwards, it's anal, of course. Of course. Um, which goes back to uh, Jess's tattoo. <laughs> and, of course, uh, backwards, it's anal. No, that's my other tattoo, which just says anal. <laughs> <laughs> Ex Luna, backwards, anal, exy. <laughs> anal, exy. Oh. Anal, anal, anal. It's a little exy. Exy. It's a exy. little expensive. <laughs> That's this, gonna cost you. Gonna cost you. This is the first Apollo mission devoted to scientific discovery of the moon. Stuff like collecting geological samples, drilling three meter holes into the surface of the moon, taking photos of possible expo- exploration sites, and experiments to develop human capability to work in a lunar environment. Isn't it amazing? Like humans famously love digging holes, but that's just you know normally some guy in his backyard. Mm. I love that even people at NASA are doing that. Yeah, we're going to the moon. What are you going to do? Dig, dig a hole. Dig a hole. Dig a hole. It's going to be pretty sick, actually. Yeah, they're going to make a sandcastle. Awesome. Give me a big shovel. <laughs> oh, it's sick. Can't wait. Moon shovel. <laughs> They also had an improved American flag apparatus on board. Okay. Neil and Buzz had erected a specifically designed flag. <laughs> I knew that I have to pause there. That appeared to be waving in the wind, even though there's no air up there. But they had trouble digging the pole into the ground, and Buzz reported that it was blown over by the rocket exhaust when they left the moon. Oh, no. Imagine, oh, crap. It's you can't go over. back for it. No. Can't just jump out. Ah, uh, yeah, that's frustrating. And this all happens. This is in Hollywood, isn't it? This happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for some reason, Sound they choose, Studio Seven. <laughs> for some reason, they choose the flag to fall over, even though it's Hollywood. Yeah, well, they, could have just just, they it couldn't up. fake it well enough. <laughs> so it fell over. So on Apollo Twelve, they made to sure the to plant the flag further away from the module. Oh, smart! But astronauts Alan Shepard and Alan Bean, Alan and Alan, had trouble with the latch that kept the pole horizontal, and the flag drooped. 
So now they've got the flag there, but it looks shit. That's a lot of disrespect. Do you know what flag. Alan's an anagram of? Anal. <laughs> Well, <laughs> we're really good podcasts. That's probably why they got selected for the mission. Yeah. Double anal. Double anal. Oh, Digging holes, down. double penetration <laughs> on the moon. Anal so nice. <laughs> <laughs> they did it twice. <laughs> so on Apollo 13, they had a flag with a double locking mechanism. Again, it's someone's job to design stuff. Like yeah. That. What are you in charge of? I made the flag. For the moon. I made the flag. And then it, and then it droops. You're like, ah, oh, crap. Uh, <laughs> ah, crap. <laughs> yeah, crap. Uh, so the Apollo spacecraft was made up of two independent spacecraft joined by a tunnel. Little connection. Ooh. There's the orbiter called Odyssey. That's good. Which Jim Lovell was apparently like, that's a great name. That's We're going good. on a, an Odyssey. Yeah. And land, and then there's also the lander called Aquarius. Okay. The Odyssey is the command module and service module, which I'll talk about a bit, bit more. It's kind of like the mothership that all three astronauts travel on their way to the moon and back. It's the main bit where they sit. Bit of room in there, very solidly built and quite comfortable to be in. Okay. Great it's got place. Some nice cushions. Yes. There's seats in there. There's some little fake plants or something that add a bit of you know, greenery. Yeah. There's a pool table. Oh, that's nice. The ball's flying around. <laughs> yeah. Ow! <laughs> Isn't it interesting to think, you know, if there were people on other planets, to, that would be a UFO to them. And they'd be getting out in their spaceman suits. And like, who are these? Interesting creatures. Doesn't that make you think? We wow. would, in fact, we'd, be the aliens. We'd be the aliens. Yeah. Imagine. Oh, I don't like to imagine that. <laughs> and then they get out and they plant a flag that droops and they're like, oh, <laughs> not a very advanced civilization. Yeah, they're quite pathetic, aren't they? <laughs> well, Leave them sad. alone. <laughs> Lower your weapons for these yeah. <laughs> little pathetic <laughs> aliens. So they're in the Odyssey in the command module, service module. And when they get there, the plan is the lunar module Aquarius breaks away with two members. It's the thing that looks quite like a spider. Yeah. And takes them to the surface of the moon while the third member orbits in the command module. The lunar module is much more basic, but that's fine because they don't plan to spend much time in it. Then they fly home in the command module and service module. The service module drops off just before they enter the Earth's atmosphere and the conical flask-shaped command module splashes down into the ocean. Navy sh- picks them up. Piece of cake. Okay. So that, that's what happened. That was number 12? Uh, that is what happened with number 12. Yep. And that's the plan for 13 as well. In theory, quite simple. They've done it twice now. Easy peasy. How hard could it be? Yeah. Yeah, I, as long as they don't get complacent, I guess. It feels like any time people say how hard can it be, it's like that's just guaranteeing success. Yeah. Exactly, which is what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. So the commander of the mission was Jim Lovell, who I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. Tom Sele- Hanks. This is Tom Hanks. Yeah. Uh, selected as an astronaut in 1962, Lovell was making his fourth space flight and second trip to the moon. He's the first person to ever achieve those milestones. Wow. He'd been a pilot of Gemini 7, or as they say, Gemini 7. Who Gemini 7. That? Americans. They they say Gemini, Gemini. Gemini. What? Well, at least the astronauts I've heard in interviews when they talk about the program, they call it Gemini. Well, I'd probably, I'd probably take that. Yeah, that's for. what I mean. <laughs> I don't want to say all Americans, but definitely some of the Jim Lovell himself, he calls it Gemini. Gemini. Gemini Cricket. Gem- wow. <laughs> Gemini Gillikins. I've never heard of that. No, me either. I know they say aluminium, aluminum, because they spell it different, but mm. I haven't. And what else? You know, they say uh, all sorts of things. Nissan, Nissan, Adidas. Adidas is fun. Adidas. They say okay. Nike. Yep. I think all of these are probably the correct way to say them as well, and we say them wrong. But mm. I love those little cultural differences it's fun, isn't it? between us and them. Hey. I went for a job interview at Nike, and and one of the first things she said in this group interview is, and so just so you guys know, it's Nike. Yeah. Not Nike. Because we say Nike. Well, a lot of us, I always said Nike. Yeah, but you're of a different generation. Um, uh, people your I'm age. I'm technically, I'm not, but. Say stuff wrong. Same generation, actually. So. Well, I mean, canonically. Oh, not canonically. Yeah. <laughs> I'm from a time before generation. <laughs> Certainly not culturally. <laughs> <laughs> I learned so much from you kids. <laughs> I'm keeping you young. For example, I, I tell you about 1960s space missions. Yeah, it's fun. Keeping Ooh. you young. So Jim Lovell had been the pilot of Gemini 7, command pilot of Gemini 12, and command module pilot of Apollo 8, the first piloted mission to the moon. He was also Neil Armstrong's backup commander for Apollo 11. 
So Neil pulled out he was going to be the first on the moon. Wow. So he's very experienced. He's what you'd call an astronaut's astronaut. Okay. <laughs> that's what that's what well, I that's would what call. I'd say. Oh, that's what you'd say, yeah. Uh, now 42, he was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, God's country. God's country. In 1928, before coming becoming an astronaut, he served in the Navy where he landed fighter jets on aircraft carriers in the dark during bad weather. He's wow. a great pilot. He then became a naval test pilot, locking 7,000 flying hours, which is uh, That's a lot of hours. quite a lot. How many days is that nonstop? How many virgin velocity points is that? <laughs> 7,000. <000. laughs> you don't get that many. Oh, you get one per sucks. hour. Yeah. It's actually not that good, is it? No, that's not a great deal. He married his high school sweetheart, Marilyn, and together they had four children, Barbara, James, Susan, and Jeffrey. Good names. Great names. Jim Lovell's nickname, JP, so if you like this, was Shaky. Hate that. No, I love it. Uh, fellow future astronaut Pete Conrad had apparently given Lovell the nickname as a joke as it would be the last thing a test pilot would want to be known as. Okay, that's good then. <laughs> that is good. You do not want a shaky Ooh, test pilot. Shaky. So that as a joke, he had that name and it I'd took off. I'd call him Crash and Burn. <laughs> I'd call it, this guy steals from the company. <laughs> <laughs> Lovell was originally slated to be part of Apollo 14, the mission after this, but was asked to swap with Alan Shepard who'd only just come back to the program after taking years off to treat an illness. He had something in, the, he had grit or something in his inner ear and uh, he was like, diz, dizzy for yeah, years. Yeah, vertigo. And, and he just had, obviously you don't want an astronaut with vertigo up there. No. You, so he had, he'd just come back from an operation after being oh, off for wow. years. But he was, he's also a legendary astronaut. But he, so he's asked, will you swap with Alan? He can do 14, you do 13. Apparently Jim said, sure, why not? What could possibly be the difference between Apollo 13 and oh. Apollo 14? Oh, I've never even connected it to an unlucky number. Yeah. People at the time were like, yeah, oh, are you a bit, you know, worried about it? And they were all like, huh, no, it's fine. Apollo 13, whatever. Because they're like, they're men of logic. Exactly. Not of superstition. Mm. Mm. Asked about the mission later on, they might change their mind. Okay. Also on board, so he's the, he's the commander. Yep. Jim Level. Also on board was Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes who was making his first space flight. His job is to control the lunar module that goes onto the moon. So only him and Jim Lovell will actually walk on the moon. Okay. Third person stays around. So why is that stiff third person? Yeah. They get so close, but someone's got to be in the command module. Keep it going. You know, you got Trey Cool, you got Billy Joe Armstrong walking on the surface of the moon. Poor Mike Mike Dern. Mike Dern. (laughs) Sitting in the capsule waiting. Oh, Dern. You did him dirty. Well, I guess he's of those three, he's got the dullest name, I suppose. Yeah. He's got the Mike Collins of the names. Who of us is staying in there? Can it be me? It's got to be Matt Stewart of the in terms of dullest name. <laughs> yeah, I'm, and I'm the best driver. Yeah, so therefore, oh, you've got pilot, I guess. Yeah, you'd be the head, and <laughs> and they, they need maths. Yeah, I'm definitely there making up numbers. <laughs> I'll make sandwiches or whatever you need. <laughs> we come back and you've made like six hundred sandwiches. <laughs> oh, like, is that? Is no, this helpful? Yeah. I don't know. And you're kind about it. Yeah. But you don't want my sandwiches. Oh, yeah, well, like, 600, mate, I don't you know. can't eat these in space. It's all like gel and <laughs> <laughs> toothpaste. Yeah. I'm Homer Simpsoning it. I've got the... There's a packet of chips. I've open. opened a packet of chips, yeah. <laughs> Protect the queen. <laughs> I imagine <laughs> if you went back to episode seven, I'd love to know how many of these dog shit riffs we've yeah, done both we've, times. we've 100% asked that <laughs> it's before. Been, come on, sure. It's been I long enough. I can't remember. No. I say riffs as well. Quoting The Simpsons vaguely. I reckon back then I would have said I'd stay because we didn't know what an incredible driver I am. That's true. Back then. Oh, my goodness. Now you can back it up. You can back up a lunar module, no worries. Yeah. Easy. Ah. Matt and I are coming back to the UK very soon in November. If you want to come along, do go on pod.com. And we talked about how this time, because it's just two of us going, we don't need a, a big van. Which and also is lucky. Jess isn't there to park it, so <laughs> we're probably going to hire the smallest car we can. You get a Barina. Two yeah. door. Absolutely. Meep, meep. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> we always... Jess, what a park. What a park. <laughs> Highlight of one of my lives. Jess the Park Perkins. Highlight of what one a... of my lives. <laughs> You've said too much there, Dave. <laughs> oh, hang on. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> You're the favourite of my wives. I've said too much. Oh, whoops. Highlight of one of my lives. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. What a well <laughs> It would make sense if you're some sort of alien being. Yeah. Uh, it, would, it would connect a few dots. Because of the head shape. <laughs> It's not that bad. <laughs> How do you know that's not a compliment? 
I meant that as a compliment. Thank you. You've got an outer worldly, <laughs> an otherworldly head shape. Head shape. <laughs> well, this that's is only of... funny because it's obviously not true. That would if it, if that hit it close to home. Yeah. Can I say this is one of the worst moments of one of oh, my lives? <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. Will it make a stop? No. <laughs> so we're talking about Fred Hayes, yes, lunar module guy. Born in Biloxi, Mississippi, Ooh. November 1933. Hayes, 36 years old at the time of the Apollo mission. He underwent naval aviator training from 1952 to 54. He served as a U.S. Marine Corps fighter pilot and after his military service, he returned to school and graduated with a Bachelor of Science degrees in honours in aeronautical engineering. So these are all very good pilots, also very smart people. Yeah, very qualified people. Very qualified, that's right. Very yeah, educated. A very small group of people that would qualify. Yeah, yes. Quite I think a especially niche. If, back then they were cutting half of the population out already probably because it's all men, right? Yes, and then most of these people graduate at the top of their aviator class of 100 and then from there they apply. Yeah. And then they... It's the best of the best. It's like the start of uh, yeah. Men in Black where it's like these are the best of the best. Mm-hmm. But even a lot of them get rejected. That's so sad. Isn't but it? they don't They don't remember it, of course. No. They pull out that thing and then they forget everything. Is that the same at NASA? Yeah. They, they don't remember anything. So uh, right, maybe I did apply. Uh, maybe you got in. Maybe I got maybe in. Maybe you've been to the moon. Wow, yeah. that's so true. You could yeah. deny that. Probably I've been to the moon. You've probably been to the moon. Odds are. Yeah. Statistically. In your time. Yeah. yeah. Statistically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Statistically. I mean, how many people have been to the moon? I'm the answer's sh- 12. <laughs> I, I finished top of my class uh, at some point in something, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Well done. Grade four? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Back then. Yeah. <laughs> Might nail it tailed, tailed off a little bit numbers. after that. <laughs> Grade four for you was colours and numbers. I grade four. <laughs> Probably long division, actually. Grade four isn't the fourth time you've done prep, Jess. <laughs> <laughs> this for me. Took me 12 years to finish primary what's your, school. What's your favourite shape? <laughs> Triangle. Triangle. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a circle for me, but. Wow. Makes you think. It really does. Never thought about it. Uh, so Fred Hayes, he's married. He was married to Mary and had three children: Frederick, Stephen, and Thomas. That's nice. So he's, it's a lot of dull names so far. Yeah, yeah. But that, I mean that makes sense, yeah, doesn't it? They're dull 60s. people. They're oh, dull people. sorry, it's the sixties. They hadn't invented a lot of names yet. <laughs> oh, I just think these are these are all like they're basically nerds, right? No offense to nerds, they do all the best stuff. It's important yeah. to have them. Dave, I count you as a nerd. Thank you. But your kids' names are going to be fucking dull. <laughs> oh, it'll be like Cyborg X and. <laughs> Wally one one, <laughs> Wally one <laughs> one. What was that one? Sorry. Cyborg X and Wally when one. <laughs> Wally when one. <laughs> Wally when one <wanna> wanna key. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually awesome. <laughs> Wally when one wanna key. <laughs> get your ass down here. <laughs> your father's <laughs> made baked beans. <laughs> Come on, get in here. You too, Cyborg X. <laughs> 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 what a gift you're giving those kids. Wow, beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you're never going to yell that in a park and only have one kid turn around. <laughs> Actually, you'll have most parents turn around like, what the fuck, <laughs> the fuck are you doing? The final position was command module pilot. This role stays back on the command module, Jess Birkins, orbits the moon whilst the other two go down and do their thing. No, no, that's me. Jess is. Oh, that's yes. making 600 Jess, seven, seven years ago, that's right. This is you, Matt. I'm Mike Dent, isn't it? You the Mike Dern. This is Mike Dern. Originally, the command module pilot was meant to be Ken Mattingly. And the three men trained together extensively for the mission, but only eight days out, all three men were, were exposed to rubella, also known as German, German measles. measles. <sighs> yes. By a member of the backup crew, Charles Duke. Both the main and backup crew trained together, so they were all exposed to Duke. Oh, wow. That's not good. German measles is not nice. No. I, mean, I, had, I had one of the measles as a kid. Is that... Is that different? Would it be different if Not I just sure. had measles? You might have just had measles. Right. We should have been. Uh, there was a um, fuck. It was a vaccine that did. Yeah, measles, mumps, rubella. Rubella. Yeah, you're right. And yeah. varicella or varicella, oh. which is chicken. Maybe box. I never uh, had gotcha. measles. I had no idea. I had one of them. I'm sure you were sick. At but the yeah, they got chicken pox. That's gone now, isn't it? You never had it. No, I did have it. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever have it? Twice. Really? You're not meant to get it twice, are you? Yeah, that means you're special. Remember I had it for the um, Sydney oh, Olympics. Oh, that's right. Of course. Of course. I missed out on my chance at the Olympics. Yeah. I was supposed to be Nikki Webster. 
<laughs> Nikki Webster was your understudy. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm happy for her. They could have been your strawberry kisses. I could have been on I FHM you got, at some point. You would have got her whole career afterwards. Yeah, well, obviously. Yeah. Of course, it's just handed to you on a plate. Yeah. Uh, Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes from the main crew were found to have immunity from the disease due to prior exposure. They'd already had rubella. But Ken Mattingly did not, and only being a week out from launch, NASA didn't want to risk him going to space and developing the sickness up there. Oh, that I sucks. Think that makes sense. Being hundreds of thousands of miles away and being really ill. Imagine, especially, but imagine being the first person to have rubella in space. Oh, <gasps> yes. That could be me. <laughs> I, yeah, I do. Because I think of it, you know, I, I love when something's cancelled nearly always. It's rare that I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. even a thing that I want to do. Yeah. And they, these guys obviously want to do this. Yeah. But I wonder if there was a part of him like, oh, huh, thank goodness. I got a week oh, off. I just uh, watch good. some movies. Yeah, go home. <laughs> He's like, I really like my bed. Yeah. I think they so, had more to live for. Yes, yeah, so I think you, <laughs> these people have like trained their whole lives to get to the yeah, end. I think you would be surprised. Only so time. few. I think in total, only 24 people have been there ever. So, you know, and this is the chance to be in the first. You know, nine or ten. So he's he was spewing. Have the Soviets got there by this point? Uh, no, they haven't landed. They've never landed a person. Oh, they still haven't. No. Right? Do they stop trying? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah, but they were the first to get nothing an object up there, and also they got a rocket. The... Was, it, was the object a rocket? Yeah, yeah, I think they they landed a bunch of stuff on there, like you know, fired shit into it because you don't have to land it if you just explode it onto the floor. <laughs> Whatever. Pow. So. He's out. Ken Mattingly's out. So just two days before the launch, he was replaced by backup member Jack Swigert, who did intense training with the other two Apollo crew members to get up to speed. Just two days. Far out. That's a lot of pressure, Jack Swigert. Swigert was 38 years old and had also never been to space before. What? So only Jim Lovell's been to space. He's really a lot, has a lot more experience than the other two. That's why he's the commander. I so know. is Swigert, that's, is it Kevin Bacon one of the other crew in the movie? Who yes, that? Kevin Bacon plays Play Swigert, who takes over. Right. From Mattingly, who's Gary Sinise. Ah, yes. So Gary Sinise is on home base. And who was the other? Who's, who Bill Paxton Bill plays. Bill Paxton. Fred what a Hayes. powerful trio. Yeah. Oh, what a great. class. Absolutely loved it. Absolutely. Check it out. Uh, Swigert was 38 years old and had also never been to space. As I said, he held a bachelor in, bachelor in mechanical engineering and a master in aerospace science and was a former test pilot as well. Okay. He'd wanted to fly since he was a kid, delivering newspapers at the age of 14 to save up just for flying lessons. Wow. I imagine you've got to deliver a lot of newspapers to pay for flying <laughs> lessons in like the 50s. It's so expensive. Oh, my God. Back then it would have been even rarer. Yeah. So to recap, we've got onboard commander Jim Lovell, super experienced dude, command module pilot Jack Swigert, who's been called in at the last minute, and lunar module pilot Fred Hayes. And they are supported on the ground by hundreds, if not thousands, of engineers and other experts monitoring every part of the ship and the flight mission. The average age of the flight control team was just 27. Really? Babies. Babies. Children. Which is, it is is awesome. Google Gaga, over. (laughs) (laughs) Gobble, 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 over. (laughs) Some of them were quite young turkeys. 27 is pretty old for a turkey. 27 year old turkeys, yeah. And now to guide you through the mission, we have the world's oldest turkey. (laughs) (laughs) Roger that. (laughs) Thanks, turkey. (laughs) The lead flight director was a guy called Gene Krantz, who himself is a legend of space exploration. I mean, all of these people have been legends, according to you. I don't know what to do. Well, he's NASA's uh, second flight director, so he is a. He's a famous dude. Most of these people were working out of the Apollo Mission Control Center in Houston, which is their call sign. That's why they say Houston. Did they decide to have a base NASA in Houston because of the Houston Rockets basketball team? Yeah, isn't that a bit of synergy? Yeah, they were like, actually, this could work well. Yeah, we could put this bit of cross team promo. On the map. <laughs> That's nice. That's yeah. clever. That's I love great. it when things work out like that. Yeah. Because, you know, and I love hearing stories like that where you, you'd probably think it was the other way around. Yeah. And then you're like, no, actually. Obviously, yeah, if you think about it long enough. Yeah, you idiot. Uh, I think basketball has been around a little longer than, than the moon. The moon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 God, some God, people are so stupid. <laughs> and we're dealing with these people every day. Every day. Just I'm going about our it. lives just with, surrounded by Idiots it is everywhere. Oh, Melbourne is full of them. Full of fools. Is it probably the stupidest city in the world? <laughs> I would say so. 
I reckon we should test it, but I don't even know if we waste our time. Oh, God, I can't be bothered. You know, I try and test Melbourne people. I probably wouldn't even know how to pick up a pencil. Oh, uh, what do I do? <laughs> you can't pick up. So embarrassing. You've already failed. Anyway, Dave, do go on. Uh, the other person I learned about in this report is Judith Love Cohen. Did she? That's so nice. That's lovely. Good lovely. for Cohen. Who was Cohen? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Um, it's such a long report. We're fucking around. <laughs> Judith is an engineer who had worked on the abort guidance system, AGS. <gasps> In the Apollo lunar module. Have you seen Do you know this? Her son. Yes. Had been born the year before on August 28, 1969 and would grow up to be. Tony Plugger Lockett. Jack, Jack Black. Black. What? <laughs> yeah. What? Yep. Jack Black. The JB himself. Man, I love Jack Black. I know. He's great. Fuck, and his mum. One of my favorite real people in the world. I didn't know that. Yeah. Apparently, that makes she, sense. Apparently she went into the office the day Jack Black was born. Yep. That's why he, had, it, he does have the vibe of a kid who really needed to strive for attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Look at me. <laughs> oh, you do <laughs> <laughs> According to All That's Interesting, which has a great article I know that I'll link to, when it was time to go out to the hospital, she took with her a computer printout of the problem she was working on. Later that day, she called her boss and told him that she had solved the problem and, oh, yes, the baby had been born as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell. Which is awesome. Only... 0.05% of all engineers at the time were women. Yeah. How many? 0.05%. So there's probably like two. Wow. Isn't that crazy? And one of them is Jack Black's mum. And what was it? So is Black not his actual surname? His surname's yeah. Cohen. Mm-hmm. No, it actually it is Jack Black, I believe, because I looked into that because I was going to say born, but you would know him better as, but then his name is actually Thomas Jacob Black. Yeah, right. So not Jack Black. Tom Black. Tom Black. His his uh his father was a satellite engineer. Far out. Thomas William Black. There Do you, you think go. they're um disappointed? By him? <laughs> Maybe I at mean first. He's, he's very successful and he's great. Uh, I would say universally loved. Mm. Um, but yeah, were they like? Oh, could you try a little harder in science? And he's like <laughs> yeah. nee, 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 doing guitar solos. <laughs> and then he's in that episode of the X Files where he can control electricity. Yeah. Inspired by his parents. <laughs> so United States missions are prior to liftoff controlled from the Launch Control Center, LCC, located at NASA's Kennedy Space Center on Merritt Island, Florida. So they take off from Florida. After liftoff, responsibility is handed over to NASA's Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. So that's why they always like Houston. Yeah, right. Uh, the mission was launched at the planned time of 2.13 p.m. exactly, Eastern Standard Time, on April 11, taking off from the Kennedy Space Center. Even though Neil Armstrong's first steps on the moon had been less than a year earlier at this point, Mm. an event that is still one of the most watched broadcasts in history, by April of the following year, public interest in the Apollo missions had well and truly fallen to the wayside. Apollo 12 had also succeeded in making it to the moon, so now it just seemed routine. They're like, whatever. Almost easy, like, oh, yeah, of course they're going to make it. So no no one tuned into the launch, basically. The ratings were dropping and dropping and dropping. Wow. I mean, that's not why they're doing it. But it would be nice if people yes, would watch. Yes, it would be nice if people watched. But what, if people I, cared. You can sort of understand why they wouldn't. You know, yeah. like yeah. one, it's the final frontier, and the next one it's like, oh, yeah, oh, what, I'm not watching people drive cars anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was interesting for a <laughs> I'm while I'm not turning well. up to see a train go by. Yeah. You know, I've got stuff to do. So they took off pretty pretty uh, standard. We jump forward into the mission a little bit, but generally speaking, Apollo 13 was looking like the smoothest flight of the program so far. Wonderful. At 46 hours and 43 minutes into the mission, Joe Kerwin, the capsule communicator or CAPCOM on duty, who speaks to the astronauts, said, the spacecraft is in real good shape as far as we are concerned. We're bored to tears down here. (laughs) It was the last time anyone would mention boredom for a very long time. Uh, (laughs) that's 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 a real jinx. Yeah, why would you say that? God, nothing for me to do down here. Oh, my God. Snooze. (laughs) Snooze. I'm just going to punch this black cat in the face. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck you, cat. Oh, the cat's just walked under eight ladders. I'll just follow it through. (laughs) I'll throw this broken mirror at it. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to pour my coffee all over this uh, desk full of lights in front of me. (laughs) Oh, here we go. This is cause a bit of fun. (laughs) There'll be something for me to fix. Yeah, here, work this out. As had become standard aboard the missions, the crew did a broadcast on day three with a camera and a radio, giving a 49-minute 49 49 minute tour of the craft. It's not that big. 
How does no. it take you 49 minutes? They're doing, they're doing gear. They're doing Imagine like, if funny we did bits. a 40, 49 minute tour of this room. It is honestly about this size. I reckon we could do it. <laughs> Here's a panel. Here's another panel on the wall. I reckon we could do it. Dave, that's it. taken you like. Let's do a Patreon bonus seconds. episode where we do a 49 minute tour of Ooh, this room. So 15 minutes on the bin. <laughs> That's oh. such a long time to talk about a bin. <laughs> no, I reckon we could. We go through item by item. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 49 minutes. Jim Lovell acted as a host, but he didn't know this, and it's absolutely the most tragic thing I've ever heard. No one cared. Oh. The media had completely lost interest. No TV channel had picked up the footage. What? No one was watching. There wasn't even a single media reporter in NASA's media center that day. Only their wives and children at home were watching. That is very sad, but Dave, I've got to say, if that's the most tragic thing you've ever heard, that no one watched a thing. Then this is going to be great. <laughs> I, can, I can't imagine anything else going wrong. Come on, it's so sad. That is sad. It's so sad being like, well, you gotta... and here is, because like, you know, a billion people watched his, yeah. his mate, Neil Armstrong, six months yeah. earlier. So yeah. He's like, of course people care about my big time. I've waited for this my whole life and no one watched. Matt, you've got to remember, Dave's looking at that through the lens of an entertainer. <laughs> yeah, that's and right. And what is an entertainer without an audience? That's true. Dave would be up there going, pow, pow, give yeah. us his best, you know, exactly. game show host. Nothing. Come on down. Welcome. Welcome to the command module. My name is oh. Jim Lovell. Thanks for tuning in. We have three contestants tonight. That and is no one cares. so what, tragic. What if that happens to us? A lot of people downloaded the Apollo 11 episode. <laughs> <laughs> and we go check and zero <laughs> downloads on this episode. And I'm like, I think there's a glitch. There ain't no uh, glitch, pal. <laughs> every other episode's fine. Oh, they, no one cares. <laughs> Day is razzle dazzling. It's an episode that's going to go the for like di- three the, hours. The difference is my wife wouldn't even listen. <laughs> At least his wife's watching. Yeah, no, nah, she's not. She's got she other stuff to do. She's she's got stuff well, on. that's why you call her your first wife. I'm already hearing signs <laughs> yeah. that, uh, yeah, you know, not going to support you then. Okay. Yeah. So he doesn't know. After 49 minutes, he wrapped up his big TV moment and went to put the camera away. Oh. What he didn't know and that no one knew at the time is that at that same moment, command module pilot Jack Swigert had his finger on a bomb's ignition switch. What? Let me back up a little bit. You might what? be wondering how we got <laughs> yeah. here. So the modules, there's two modules, are supplied by two oxygen tanks. These were spherical shells made from titanium no larger than a car tire. The oxygen tank also supplied the ship's f- three fuel cells that give electricity and power to the craft. Oxygen and hydrogen is combined to produce water and electrical power, kind of like renewable batteries. They keep pa- making their own power up there. The water produced was also used to cool the electrical hardware and was the astronauts' main source of drinking water. So it's very, very important, the oxygen. Yeah. Very, very important. Also, you needed to breathe. <laughs> okay. I was like, that's why I didn't give you much when you said yeah. it's very important. I was like, uh-huh. It's very, but it's, it's important in, in every way. Yes, yeah. It's integral. Yeah. What no one knew at the time was that one of the two oxygen tanks had been fumbled on an assembly line 18 months earlier. Falling just five centimetres. Oh, At the time, it didn't seem like a big deal, but a year and a half later, this would have huge ramifications. What? Inside each of the oxygen tanks is liquid oxygen stored in icy cold conditions. It's freezing in there. Fans and heaters are found within the tank to stir the liquid oxygen and keep it at the right pressure. And it's it's very cold. Icy cold. cold. You know who they should have got to look after it? The Black Thunders. Yeah. All I was thinking was, could I put a can of Coke in there? Oh, it would have been yeah. cold quickly. So cold, so quickly. And quick? Oh, fuck is that. I hate that. Get my down to St Kilda Beach. My dinner's nearly ready. I don't have a can of Coke ready. Keep your go. eyes peeled for the Black Thunders. Do they still do that? I don't listen to commercial radio. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I feel bad if I do. Triple M. <laughs> Grab yourself an icy cold can of Coke. <laughs> and the latest edition of... Us Weekly. Us Weekly? Is that a magazine about asses? Us. Oh, us. 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 <laughs> US us. Us Weekly. Us Weekly. <laughs> I made the cover of Us Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> Can they see your tattoo? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, that's wild. It, I mean, there's some parallels to the another desire. Uh, what was the episode called? The... The Challenger. Challenger disaster. That's right, very small. Small O-ring. O-ring, that's yeah. right. That had been cold and then hot and then 
broke. Kind of similar because inside it's like it's freezing. They have these fans and heaters to keep it at the right pressure inside, sort of stir it all around at the same time because otherwise I think it sort of separates in there and and uh, isn't usable. Before the missions, there were problems filling and draining one of the tanks, the same tank that had been dropped 18 months earlier. When it would not empty normally, the heaters in the tank were turned on to boil off the oxygen and things inside the tank breached recommended heat levels by a lot. Uh-oh. You see, thermostatic switches inside were designed to prevent the heaters from raising the temperature higher than 27 degrees Celsius or 80 degrees Fahrenheit, but they failed under the 65 volt power supply applied. So there's no switch that turns it off when it gets to a certain heat. So temperatures on the, on the heater tube within the tank may have reached 540 degrees Celsius or 1,000 Fahrenheit, which is 20 times hotter than they're supposed to. Supposed to get to a certain heat and then stop. But it didn't stop. It just kept getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Oh. The temperature gauge was not designed to read higher than 29 degrees Celsius. So the technician monitoring the procedure detected nothing unusual. Oh, that is a real oversight. <laughs> Isn't that real bad? Freaking it's like, hell. Oh, this thing turns off at 27 and the gauge tops out at 29 and then inside it's 540 degrees. What? Whoops. The Teflon insulation surrounding wires connected to the fans melted under the <gasps> extreme heat. But no one knows this. They've just put it in on the, the module as normal and then they've taken off. And now bare wires are exposed inside the oxygen tank waiting to short out, spark and start a fire because it's surrounded by oxygen. Oh! So now Jack Swigert, who I said has got his finger on the ignition switch, he's been asked to run a standard cryo stir and power up the fans within the tank to get it all moving again. There's so much gibberish in this. Cryo stir. Oh, yeah. that's Basically, he's, he's got to move the frozen oxygen inside with a fan. He flicks the switch and a fan turns on. Yeah. So standard, so normal, but he has his finger on a detonation key because he starts the cryo stir and then there is a massive bang. Lovell was still taking the camera down to the command module, feeling like I nailed that live TV cross. <laughs> to millions, <laughs> to millions of people. people. I'm famous now. Immediately he felt the huge bang that rocked the whole spacecraft. Jim Lovell described the event as a... Bang Wump Shudder. Does that put it into context yeah, for you? Okay, I think that makes sense. That was a Bang yeah. Wump Shudder. Yeah. I was just thinking like you're feeling bad for a level, but he ended up being played by Tom Hanks in a like an Academy Award winning film. So yeah. Based on a book that he wrote. Yeah. So I think in the end you can't feel too bad for him. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> And he wrote the book. Oh, that's a good sign. That's a great sign. Unless he... He wrote it really quickly. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, quick. Someone grab a pen. I'm going to radio down my book. <laughs> Chapter one. My name is Jim Lovell. <laughs> I was born in Ohio in 1928. <laughs> Chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> whatever. Skip through. Do a bit about, you know, how I was really good in the Navy. Get my blah, wife blah, blah, blah. to fill in some of the middle <laughs> bits. Yeah, that's right, whatever. And, uh... and we'll get to this bit. <laughs> Jim Swaggart just blew up the fucking ship. <laughs> They've got no idea what's going on. There's here this big bang. He looked at Swaggart. This is Lovell. And he said, his eyes were as wide as saucers. How big are the sources? Yeah, because I mean, sources could be any could size. Have tiny little sources. <laughs> they could be like, what are they sources this for? Could, a, look, for an ant? <laughs> my eyes could be as wide as ant sources right now. Yeah, it's true. Not wide at all. Look, maybe his book's not as good as I. I, I for thought. listeners at home, Jess is currently squinting. Mm-hmm. Now she's going wide-eyed. <laughs> They're more like sources of as a, wide as they go of a cockroach. Yeah, cool. much bigger than an ant. Human, because they're obviously not human <laughs> sources. There, they'd be huge, massive. That's almost massive. as big as a face. Yeah, yeah, you know, a normal shaped face, not Dave's. <laughs> it's very otherworldly. It's not my face; it's my head. Apparently, it's <laughs> otherworldly. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Oh, I hit a nerve. I my saucer I, eyes I, I are had fine. A, I had a stab at anything, and I, I accidentally hit a nerve. <laughs> no, you hit a a weird looking head. <laughs> <laughs> you hit. A boy. <laughs> <laughs> right through the heart. <laughs> a bullseye, Jess. If that was your aim. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you plan to destroy me, well, mission accomplished. <laughs> Houston, we have a broken heart. <laughs> Jim, is that you? He's like, I just found out that no one was watching my TV show. So they've got no idea what's going on. Big bang. The spark in a pure oxygen atmosphere resulted in a ferocious fire that increased the pressure inside the tank until the tank dome failed, filling the fuel cell bay with rapidly expanding gaseous oxygen and combustion products. Basically, it's exploded. Shit. A titanium tank. Like one of the, a very, very, very strong material. Oh, my God. 
The pressure rise was sufficient to pop the rivets holding the el- aluminium or aluminum exterior panel covering sector four and blow it out, exposing the sector to space, which fortunately snuffed out the fire. Oh. Otherwise it would have kept burning because there's uh, no oxygen out there for it to burn. Yeah. So it stopped. The detached panel, so it blew off a, a panel on the side, hit the nearby high gain antenna, disabling the narrow beam communication mode. This is a lot more gibberish, Matt. And interrupting communication with Earth for 1.8 seconds while the system automatically switched to the backup mode. Okay. So then they could communicate again. Yeah, yeah. But so for just... 1.8 seconds, they <laughs> couldn't communicate. Sorry, what did you say? I didn't say anything. <laughs> oh, I <don't... laughs> sorry. Oh, no, sorry. You just cut out for 1.8 seconds. So needy. Oh, my God. That's me, actually, around my house. Are you talking to me? Oh, you're talking to the dog. Okay. Can you talk to me? <laughs> <laughs> so this all happens in seconds after the, after he does the cryo stir. Wow. But the astronauts can't see any of this from where they are. They can only hear it. That's spookier. Which is they just hear lots of noises. Six or seven warning lights lit up on the instrumental panel, including the master alarm and a blue restart light. And they're like, that looks That's real bad. That's good. This really confuses the astronauts as the warning lights come from different systems, meaning more than one thing is malfunctioning at the same time. Because usually there's, you know, this system goes down and there'll be a warning light here, but now they've got like seven at the same time. They're like, oh, my God, something is seriously wrong up here. It's then we come to one of the most famous misquotes in Hollywood history. Houston, we have a problem. Have you- a problem. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Hang on. She's assassin in all angles and directions now. I'm an assassin. An ass assassin. <laughs> Dave's given you nothing because he's still hurt. He's mad at me. I, I hate want... to say it. It's not because he's distracted by his own report. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, I lost my place for a moment there, but I'm back. Stressful, isn't it? No, I don't panic under <laughs> conditions. Like seven alarms going off and I think I'm about to die. I'd be like, all right, I'm died. But they're like. I'm died. I'm, no, no, I'm no. died. I'm right, I'm Weird Wally Wacker Warnicky, I love you. <laughs> CyberX, you all right? <laughs> it's good to have favourites. <laughs> so. The, we all know the line from the movie, but the Apollo 13 flight journal lists the dialogue after the explosion as Swigert says, okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. And Jack Lausma back on ground says, this is Houston. Say again, please. And Lovell jumps in and says, ah, uh, Houston, we've had a problem. Okay. That's not miles away. <laughs> but in the 1995 film Apollo 13, the actual quote was shortened to Houston, we have a problem. Screenwriter William Broyles Jr. made the change, <laughs> stating that the verb tense actually used wasn't as dramatic. Mm. He's like, he punched it up. Yeah. Uh, the verb tense was less dramatic. Houston, what I chose had a pro- to do. That would, if Tom Hanks said that, Houston, we've had a problem. I think would, that's still pretty iconic, isn't yeah. it? Well, who am I to judge? Because the quote ranked at number 50 on AFI's 100 Greatest Movie Quotes in June oh, 2005. Can we guess what number one is? Yes, have a guess. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Bullseye. Is it? Yes, yeah. well done. Oh, fuck. Which is incredible. And I think it would have been hilarious. That's actually an alarm going off. <laughs> I think that that would have been the best response from Houston. Houston, we've had a problem. Frankly, Frankly my dear, dear, I don't, don't give a damn. damn. Sorry, can you repeat that? Oh, that's awesome. Well done. That's so good, Bob. What a guess. If it was me, I'd pick no. the first thing that Caesar the Chimp says in um, <laughs> the Planet of the Apes reboot. Yeah. No. <laughs> Learning to talk. Oh, we all know it. <laughs> or what about... It's a classic. What, 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 yeah, I can't think of it. Number when, two. Come and need a bigger boat. That's a good one. Uh, Number 35. I'm your father, Luke, but it's different from it's what it's... No, was. I'm your father. No, I'm your father. <laughs> Is that in there? Did that make it? No, but number two does reference a f- father, the godfather. I'm going to make him an offer he, he can't, can't refuse. refuse. I'm going to make him an offer. <gasps> They can't Holy shit, Matt. <laughs> that's good. Was that? That was actually really good. <laughs> was that you doing Darth Vader? Yes. <laughs> wow, that's good. I'm your father and you cannot refuse. Okay, you've lost it a bit now, but the first time was very good. <laughs> well, that one was a that was I was doing James Earl Jones doing Oh, then that was offensive. Marla Brando. <laughs> wow. Oh, okay. Okay. Doing the Godfather. Right, okay. Uh the only Star Wars quote, number eight, may the force be with you. Oh, yeah, mm. of course. Be with you. Um, all right. And also what about, with you. What about um, 
We lift up our hearts. Tell him he's dreaming. That make it? Yeah, is that on there? Let me have a look. What about Rissoles? I can't that believe Rissoles and dreaming didn't make Dad, it. Dad, I dug another hole. It's filling with water. Is that one on there? No, it didn't make it. Neither oh. did the what jousting about, sticks. What about... <laughs> It's uh, it's just the vibe. Oh, that would have that's number four. Marbo. <laughs> number four. <laughs> I just keep saying number Marbo. Four. <laughs> yeah, I'm fascinated by going through these. I can't believe I got it. What a guess! What, fantastic, Frank Madero. What was the a, what was the other one on the podium? Uh, third on the podium. It's uh, from on the waterfront. Oh, I don't know I don't what know that know is. It. I think that's two. From Marlon Brando in the top oh. three. You don't understand. I could have had class. I oh. could have been a contender. Oh, I could I have been quote. somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. I do know that quote, but I, I, I don't know if I know what the movie's I'm about. I'm not sure I even know the quote. I could have been a contender. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's, it's amazing that he got two out of the three. Yeah. Uh, number four, Toto. I don't Got a feeling we're not in Kansas Kansas anymore. That's a good one. Number five, Casablanca. He's looking at you, kid. kid. Number six, go ahead. Make Make my my day. day. Is that that Dirty Harry or something? Mm -hmm. It's from Sudden Impact, but yes, it is uh, the Clint Eastwood movie. Sunset Boulevard, number seven. All right, Mr. Demille, I'm ready for my close-up. I don't know if I know that one. These are all very old films. Yes, I'm trying to look at the most recent one. Looks like to be 80s. Red Pill, Blue Pill? Hustle the Vista Baby, 91. Uh, I'm trying to think of, see if there's any more recent ones. We could do a whole report on this. Forrest Gump, 94. Hey, let, well, Life is like a box of chocolates? Yes. Why don't you say, why don't we do that as the as a bonus episode this month? Just okay, go. we'll go through some. that would be a fun game because <clears throat> I'll forget. But um, you say like the name of the movie and we have to try and guess what quote yes, it is. Yes. Good times. Love that. That sounds fun. That sounds like a fun improv game for us. <laughs> Yes, and. (laughs) Okay, so back to the Apollo 13. Oh, yeah. Something major has just happened on board. The astronauts can't see anything that's happening outside. Their first thought is that a meteorite may have hit the spacecraft. Wow, that's their first thought. The confusion is only added to when the thrusters unexpectedly kick in and the ship starts to rock from side to side. Oh, I don't like that. I get seasick. (sighs) You wouldn't like it. Space sick? Yeah, would would I get space sick? Do you get motion sick in space? Absolutely, yes. Even in the Apollo 13 movie, Listen. Bill Paxton vomits. Really? Yeah. Man, I can't go anywhere. I can't go on boats, Sorry. planes, Bill space. Bill Paxton's death. <laughs> <laughs> on the ground, flight controller Cy Liebergott. Can't believe that the oxygen tanks and the fuel cells all look to be failing at the same time and reasons that these must be incorrect results are what he calls instrumentation funnies. Instrumentation funnies. Yeah. He used to be the producer of that. <laughs> yeah, that's the right. project. At NASA. <laughs> at NASA. <laughs> the instrumentation funnies at NASA. His console is lighting up like a Christmas tree. He looks at the panel and Oxygen Tank 2 is showing no readouts and he can't make sense of it. It looks like it doesn't exist anymore because it doesn't. Right, but he's like, well, that can't be. Because he's he thinks a titanium sphere can't blow up. Mm. But guess what, Cy? It just did. Whoa. He's got like optimism bias or whatever you call it. Yeah, he's like, oh, that can't that, happen. That can't be. It, obviously, it's not a disaster. Yeah. It must be, everything must just be fine. Yeah, it must just, if for everything to malfunction at once, this much, it must just be a computer glitch. Yeah, how could that actually happen? He's just like tapping the screen. Trying to refresh. Yeah, he's got the spinning wheel, wheel of death. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm going to do a restart here. But back up on the ship, the astronauts have no doubt that this is something way more serious than a malfunctioning meter. And they see evidence of something gone terribly wrong when they look out the window and see small bits of debris coming from the craft and floating past them. Oh, yeah, you don't want to see your craft floating past no. you. Oh, God, no. On board, Fred Hayes says into the comms that he heard a bang, but on the ground, Mission Control miss him saying that, and in the crisis that follows, the information isn't relayed down. So alarms are going off, the craft is being rocked from side to side. No one can make any sense of the readouts. It's absolute chaos up there and on the ground. So when he says, oh, I heard, I, I think I heard a bang, no one hears him say that. Mm. So they don't start investigating an explosion for a little Still while. Still no one's watching them. I know. Just can't get an audience. <laughs> so no one's tuning in, even their it's colleagues. It's the most tragic thing I've ever heard. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, Fred, we had you on mute. You were really boring. <laughs> it was such a beautiful line and a beautiful reading of that line. I heard a bang. <laughs> <laughs> In training, the astronauts have trained for almost every failure imaginable, but not this. They've prepared for failing instruments or leaks or thrusters misfiring, but never all of these all at once. It's a true nightmare scenario. Ugh. 
And it's only getting worse when they realize that due to the depleted oxygen levels, they're running out of power. It's decided that the crew should use the command module batteries to run everything. These batteries are designed for use on re-entry back into Earth's atmosphere. They're only designed for a few hours of power and things are pretty desperate so they use the batteries now because they've got no power. But this decision will haunt them later on. Oh, no. On the ground, flight control is still trying to work out if it's a real or imagined problem. I can't work it out. Oh, it's brutal. Are they <laughs> yeah. making it up? <laughs> yeah. You guys panicking up there? This is a prank because it's not funny. This is not funny. We want to get a bed. <laughs> Many are still going on the theory that it's just malfunctioning meters. They decided to call someone who would definitely know. A certain <gasps> steely-eyed missile man. Yeah. Neil Armstrong. John Aaron. <laughs> Remember, he's the guy that saved Apollo 12 with his encyclopedic knowledge of the meters and the readouts. Someone calls him at home whilst, and they get him whilst he's shaving. And he asks them to read out a few different numbers. He's like, all right, give me this number. Give me that one. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's that's not a malfunction. That's a real problem. Like he just knows from oh, the numbers. Oh, that is amazing. He says, "That's there's something serious going on up there. And they're like, holy shit, it's been confirmed by John Aaron, man, the steely-eyed missile man, which is so amazing. <laughs> steely-eyed missile man. <laughs> It's gotta be that's that's gotta be top fifty nicknames all time. It's very good. Oh, I fucking love it. So good. We're this, not calling you it. Oh, come on. No. You're already the cobra, mate. You owe me this, Jess, after cracking at my appearance. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I owe it to you after being honest about your weird shaped head. Can you be honest about my steely eyed Michelin man? Michelin man? Yeah, yes. Michelin man. I'll take steely eyed Michelin man. As long as I'm the steely eyed Michelin Shan man. Shan man. <laughs> I'm the steely eyed Shan man. Shan man. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, look, um, no one else heard it, but when we were watching The Mummy in Sydney a few weeks ago, Holy every shit. time uh, The Mummy himself moved around and disappeared into a, <laughs> like a pile of sand, Matt would just lean over to Jess and I and say, Sham man. <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. It's so funny. Uh, no one else heard it. But Remember when you were too scared to call something out? Yeah, I was, and I was like, Jess, you should say this. <laughs> he was feeding me jokes. So he was too shy. Because you were killing. You had them in the palm I of your hand. I was crushing. Good fun. Fuck, we're fun to watch a movie with. Yeah. <laughs> Shan man. Shan man. <laughs> <laughs> <Steely> Irish man. <laughs> so John Aaron's confirmed something serious is happening. Jim Lovell comes to the same conclusion when he looks out and sees a hose and a gaseous substance leaking out of the ship. Ooh. So he sees a hose, a hose, and, and then like gas is pouring out. This, and he's like, "Can see gas? Yeah, that's not good. Yeah. I don't. You don't usually look out and see that. Yeah, that's not good. What he's seeing is liquid oxygen pouring out into space and freezing solid. The bad news is this isn't oxygen leaking from tank two, because that's gone in the explosion. This is leaking from tank number one. Oh no! The only other tank they had. Oh, no. So if lost one completely, the other one is pissing out oxygen into space. And they, and they, need, they that. need this. They need this. This is like literally the air they're breathing. The air they're breathing, it's the stuff that combines for water. That water uh, also combines for electricity. So the big three things you need to live up there. Right. From the pyramid of needs. Yeah, that's right. They're all right up the Their top. Their shelter will die. <laughs> they're the top or the bottom of the pyramid? Uh, at the moment, they don't know where they are. <laughs> oh, yeah, because of zero gravity. Pyramids don't make sense in space. No. Pyramids of needs. Haslow? <laughs> see the man we're talking about here? Sure. Who's the guy who does the pyramid of needs? No idea. Hasbro. Hasbro. <laughs> Is there not a guy? It's the someone's... Doesn't matter. I just assume Dave knows everything and that must be such a burden <laughs> when I just throw things at you all the time. Huh? Who is it again, Dave? That guy with the pyramid of needs? Yeah, was it uh, Cheops? Was he the guy that built the pyramid? Also known as Khufu. Remember that from a few weeks ago? Anyway. Nah, of course not. <laughs> I just took my jumper off and I showed just my nipples. Sorry about that. I did not see your nipples. strawberry kisses. So if you could lift your T-shirt back up, please. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, I missed my one chance. I also took my jumper off. Does anybody want to see my nipples? Nah. Okay, because it's weird. I'm going to tell myself to do a lot. <laughs> so Maslow. Jeez, I was Maslow. close. Hasbro. <laughs> So they're leaking oxygen from tank number one. And because of this, two of the f three fuel cells are down. The remaining fuel cell needs oxygen to produce electricity. To keep the oxygen flowing, the tank needs to have a certain level of pressure. But because the tank is leaking, and it's losing pressure rapidly. If it drops below a certain level, the power will stop. 
Holy shit. To keep up the pressure, they need to turn the heaters inside on, but this takes up more power, but they're running out of power. So it's a, it's a horrible cycle. So it they, sounds like a convoluted version of speed. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it is like, all right, got to keep this level. <laughs> yeah, because basically uh, you got to turn the power up to keep the oxygen flowing, mm. to keep the electricity flowing, but you're running out of that. So you're running out of everything all at once. Terrifying. It's a horrible, horrible cycle. Cy si Liebercott radios up. He says... We're going to get down to 100 PSI in an hour and 54 minutes. That's the end right there. Are they are they still on their way up to the moon? Uh, it, they're very quickly realizing that they're not going to make it to the moon right. and that this is now a survival mission, which yep. is devastating for everyone. But they're but they're still heading away from Earth. Yes, heading away from Earth at this, at this point. Can I just turn it around? Yeah. Yui. Chuck a Yui? Chuck a Yui. You got so much space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're well, doing a three point three turn point up there. <laughs> That'll be so bad. Just turn. Just turn. It's fine. You're not going to hit anything. You don't know. This turning circle on this. I is don't know bullshit. this area. <laughs> yeah. And then you, you just listen to them, just do a turn, hit a fire hydrant. They're very deep gutters here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to tuck the nose into the bluestone gutters. <laughs> so they're running out of. Oxygen pressure, meaning soon the service module, the command service module, will be unusable and they need to find an alternative. Chris Craft, the inventor, Chris Craft, which sounds like Chris Cross, the inventor. (laughs) (laughs) Why is that so funny? It's just so funny that you just, you stop to let us know <laughs> that a word sounded like another word. Chris Craft sounds like Chris Craft. It really uh, t- took me by surprise. You know when you're writing stuff down, you say it out loud for the first time, you're like, oh, interesting. Chris, Chris Craft sounds like Chris Craft. <laughs> Chris Craft. <laughs> Important to note that. Uh, Chris Craft, Chris Cross, the inventor of the concept of mission control is called in. He was at home showering. So they're very clean people. (laughs) Yeah. Shave and shower 24-7. Got to be clean. Chief Flight Director Gene Kranz calls him and says, Chris, we're in deep shit. Ooh. So they're calling in all the experts. And on the ground they've got many theories as to where the dangerous air leak that's killing the module is coming from. A big one is that it's coming from one of the three fuel cells themselves. When the valves are open, they allow hydrogen and oxygen to mix and react, which creates power in the fuel cells. The theory is if they close the valves, then they might be able to just stop the leak. Right. The thing is when the valves are closed, they can no longer provide electricity, so it becomes useless. And once they're closed, they can't be reopened. Oh, shit. So it's a gamble. Right. To close two of the fuel cells, valves, because they've you've only got one fuel cell left after that. But they're desperate, so they go for it. They decide, all right. Because the alternative is that they just die. In yeah, they're going to die anyway, anyway. So they're like, all right, we may as well. So they, they close them. Sadly, it does not stop the leak. Oh. So now they've just turned off Fuck. two of the fuel cells for good. They can't get them back online. Down to just one fuel cell and losing oxygen pressure, the command module is dying and they're running out of options fast. In desperation, they have to think outside the box and go for a completely untested plan because they need a lifeboat. And they've got one, but that's not what it's designed for. Cy Liebergott suggests that they use the lunar module or the LEM as a lifeboat. Ah. They should move the three men from the command service module into the LEM. This has never been properly considered or rehearsed before. You know, NASA's gone through fucking every scenario, yeah. ever, but they have not considered this before. It's not, it's not regular. It has no contingency plan, but they're like, all right, that's still got power. We'll move from this side of the craft to the other. Yep. With no other option and only 15 minutes left of power time, they decide to jump ship to the attached limb. 15 minutes Is before. Is it one of those situations where they like, don't take any personal belongings <laughs> yeah. or can they like pack some snacks? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Don't wear high heels. Because you don't know how long you're going to be in there. So like, can I grab some snacks? I think it's fair. I, I can love, I grab some I snacks? I love to snacks. Yeah. There's time for snacks. Yeah. There's always time for snacks. So thank you. Can you bring your, you know, your whatever you've stowed in the overhead lockers? Yeah, of course. All right, great. That's your, that's, your, my laptop. that's your special stuff. Cool. You've got a spare jacket, mm. spare pair of underpants in case something goes wrong. In case I shit myself. <laughs> yeah. Is that what you <laughs> mean? Yeah. Something in case you, something you, goes wrong. You're being a gentleman about it. <laughs> but it's not an easy swap. 
To add to the stress, they have just minutes to transfer precious navigation data from the Odyssey's command module computer to those in the Aquarius lunar module. Floppy disks, is that what we're looking at? They're actually having to put it in by hand. Oh. And if they if they lose or misenter the data, they won't know where they are in space and navigating home would be impossible. Oh, shit. They've got to put in all, all their positions and stuff. Can they not oh. see Earth? It's over there. Like, how hard is it? It's the that's it's the big blue one. The blue one. Go to that one. Oh no, we went to the red one. Idiots. <laughs> Shit. And Jim Lovell has to do it all by hand, taking the figures from one computer, writing it down, doing arithmetic to factor in the difference of position between the Odyssey and Aquarius. So he's doing maths in that stressful situation by hand, and then he runs to the other computer and then types it all in. He moves back and forth between them. Any mistakes would mean they won't know where they are. Terrifying. Far out. Command module then has to be turned off in space, something it's never been designed to do. In fact, they're not sure if it can ever be turned back on. And they know that to get back to Earth, they'll have to get back into the heavily protected command module for rear en- entry or burn, or they'll burn up. You said rear entry there, Dave. I wrote re re entry. <laughs> re re entry. So that was even worse what I wrote. <laughs> so. Does that make sense? So, so they they're getting into the lunar module. Yeah, which is still attached to the command module, but then they close the hatch behind them. But then they're going to have to get back into the command in order to. Yes, but basically they're like, all right, we've got no power for it now. We'll t- we'll turn it off now. We'll get back to Earth, and then we'll hope to God that we're able to turn the command module back on with the little power for we've got for re-entry because the lunar module is very thin yeah. and it can't withstand re-entry into Shit. the Earth's atmosphere. So they're, they're basically taking a big gamble and being like, all right, and if, we'll worry about that later. We'll survive now, and then when we get back to Earth, hopefully we can turn that thing back on. It's never been designed to do that, though. Whoa. You're not supposed to turn it off. Okay. And that's just so you maintain 15 minutes of power. Is that right? Yeah, because they just need a little bit of power to get back in into Earth so that they're like, all right, well, we'll keep the power yeah. on this side of the craft. So it feels it. like it's a very narrow window of, you know, possibly getting through this now. It, like a lot of things have to go right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Lot feels of... like nearly nothing can go wrong from here. <laughs> no, no, it cannot. <laughs> but it does. Oh. oh. They also have to power up the lunar module, which if going by the usual procedure and checklist takes two full hours. But they don't have two hours. They only have minutes and levels scribbled notes. So they're quickly turning it all on. But it's not like uh, a car where you just turn the ignition on. You've got to put this bit on, then this, then this, flick this switch, flick this, blah, blah, blah. Do it all in a precise order or, or it'll fail. But they're just going bang, 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 bang. Just doing it really, really fast. Far out. That's stressful. So stressful. And no one's really sure if it will work because the lunar module is not designed to push the 60,000 pound, pound command module. It's not a little tugboat. No, it's not supposed to do that. Mm. It's the smaller part. It's yeah. got the smaller engine. It's just, it's just for zipping around. Exactly. It's, it's like, sort of like it's like um, you've got a big RV, you know, you're driving around town, but you've got a little like gets. Oh, that you like tow, tow on, the back? on the back. Yes, and that's just for zipping around to the supermarkets. Little Hyundai. You got a Hyundai. Hyundai. But, but then the the RV has absolutely you know yeah. shut itself. So now you have to drive the gets. The gets. And, and tow the RV. That's yeah. exactly what's happening, Jess. Well done. I nailed it. I think that's another one. Like Americans say that one right. Hun, Hyundai. Like we Sunday. Say Hyundai. And we say Hyundai. Hyundai. We're idiots. Well, we're in Melbourne. That's right. Surrounded by these fools. <laughs> <laughs> so this throws off the lunar module center of gravity and it doesn't respond to Lovell's controls as expected because it's now got this big thing attached to it. So on the fly, he has to. Relearn how to control the module. Lovell said, I literally had to learn how to maneuver or how to place my controller to get to the proper position. It took a while for me to do that. But fortunately, when you're in deep trouble, you learn pretty fast. Yeah. Oh, man. Probably just looked up a YouTube tutorial. <laughs> yeah, quickly. He's got his laptop with him. So Put yeah. on double speed and then the bit at the start. Hello, thank you and <laughs> welcome back to another. Remember just to like, to... comment just and subscribe. Just tell me how to do it. <laughs> First, a message from our sponsors. (laughs) Squarespace. (laughs) So the lunar module, also known as the LEM. Not lemon, hopefully. Hopefully not. (laughs) It's designed to take two of the crew down to the moon. It's much smaller and is only designed to sustain two men for 45 hours at a time. But now it's a lifeboat that will have to support three men for much, much longer. Oh, much longer than 45 hours. Much longer. Oh, dear. 45 hours. Mm. Oh, wow. And so there's only two seats? 
Yeah, so I guess one of them has to crouch. What have I told you? There's sit on the lap no or? seats. There's no seats. Okay. Can't sit down. No, it's very, okay. very small. Okay, how many beds are there? Ten. Well, that's right then. <laughs> Is it still zero gravity? Yes. So you don't really need to sit when you can float. That's true. It's true. But in the command module, it's much more comfortable. There's room for everyone. Oh, more comfortable than floating on air. <laughs> Jeez. God, God you you have impossible standards. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Commander Jim Lovell, he was staying positive. He said, as long as we were still breathing, we were going to go as long as possible. If you want to put it in percentages, there was a 10% chance we'd make it home again when the tank exploded. As we solved one problem after another, the percentages went up. Love okay. that. He's a very mathematical man. Yeah. 10% chance isn't great, but it's also not completely hopeless. Mm. No. It's worth a shot. I'd, yeah, that would, that would be just enough for me to have some hope. Okay. 10%? <laughs> Ten to one, like there's, the odds are worse that the Saints will win the Premiership next year, for instance. Yeah, quite a bit worse. <laughs> <laughs> Would you risk stake your life on it? No, probably not my life, but I, I'm willing to have a go. Yeah, okay, good on you. Now, this has all happened within two hours of the explosion, oh. so it's uh, it's been a chaotic couple of hours for everyone. But now they have to get back to Earth, which we'll cover after this message from our sponsors. Okay, so now they're in the lunar module attached to the fully dead command module. They have to work out how the hell to get back to Earth. Essentially, there's two options. One, Jess, on the money, is to try and turn around and go back to Earth the way they came. Pull a Yui. Well, what's the other option? Keep going and live on the moon? <laughs> well, no, if you keep going forever, I think eventually the galaxy just comes back around. Oh, yeah, good long <laughs> way home. Actually, it's actually a donut shape, yeah. Yeah. But they're not sure if the main engine is working after the explosion, so they decide they can't just turn around and go directly back to Earth. Okay. So what are they going to do? The Maybe other option. they could use something as a slingshot. <laughs> they could swim. <laughs> well, they just need to find a star or something to bounce off. Mm. You know, pinball it back. If I if space movies are to be believed, yeah. Or like a wormhole <gasps> that like goes there and then they go back into Jim Lovell's bedroom and he can just go home. Yeah. Through the back of the, his bookshelf. <laughs> they just land in his house and crush his whole family. <laughs> but they're alive, aren't they? The other not option. The family, yeah, dead. Sorry, oh, just, sorry. Obviously not the family. family yeah. dead. The other option is continue on towards the moon, fly past it, and then back towards Earth using Earth's gravity. This is called a return to Earth trajectory. They use the gravity of the moon to pull themselves towards that because now they're close enough to the moon that the moon's starting to pull them towards it. They go around the moon in an orbit. When they Then they use an extremely precisely timed thrust from the LEMS thruster to put them on course back to Earth. Once they get to a certain point, the Earth's gravitational pull will start pulling them back towards They're Earth. They're just cruising. Yeah. So then you just float along, waiting, letting the Earth do all the work. Exactly. Make the Earth work for you. Well, I mean. For once and it's a laugh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm gonna, is that what they're going to do? They decide this is the most viable option. That's crazy. But it also comes with its own set of hurdles. It's going to take way longer. Yes, this is the long way around, meaning they'll have to conserve their very small amounts of power, water and oxygen. The crew usually get water from the fuel cell, but this isn't working properly, so they are rationed to just half a cup of water each per day. That's not much water at all. It's more than I drink. <laughs> you have a quarter of a cup? Uh, yeah, I wish. <laughs> I really should work on that. Nah, water's great. Love it. <laughs> Shout out to water. <laughs> That's, it's funny, like, when I'm just, I'm like, oh, I need to be drinking water. It's like, it's okay. But if I'm thirsty, fuck, I love a water. Yeah, it's so good. It's Chug that fucking water all the oh way down. God. Chug Jeez. a lug. Oh, yeah. Chug a lug Chug night a here lug. at my place. <laughs> <laughs> they also only had powdered food, which is usually mixed with hot water, but they don't have any of that. So instead they have a semi-freezing water mixed with stuff like spaghetti powder. Oh, yeah, just chopping up lines of spaghetti powder. <laughs> Dinner's up. <laughs> Feel what? those nose spaghettis. <laughs> oh, buongiorno. <laughs> buongiorno. <laughs> oh, wee oui, wee. Oui. That's French. <laughs> they also had, I know Jess did say about snacks, peanuts, uh, cookie and bread cubes. Okay. Ooh. Or cubes. I'm interested in bread cubes. You want a bread cube? Cookie cubes sound good too. Cookie mm. cubes sounds real cute. All of a cookie sudden they've cubes. got a buffet. <laughs> yeah. They're having a great time. They've also got ruffled chips. But they'll clog the instruments. They only they only have half a cup of water each, but there's unlimited Perrier sparkling. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Back at Houston, a Tiger team was assembled whose job was to look for any future problems the crew might face. Why Tiger? They're cool. Oh, okay. Not, yes. Yeah, so Tigers not... are nature's problem solvers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You put a problem in front of a tiger, it's, it solves it. Tiger team. I assume that would be a reason for that, but there probably is. I think the tiger team, it's just like that's just the name for like a crack team. It's right. been assembled. The team was gathered in. Ragtag fl- of band of yeah. Madewells. Yeah. Yeah, a few of them rocked up on motorbikes. They're pretty bad. Yeah, they're like, they, these guys, I know they're the best, but God damn it, they're hard to rein in. Hey, mm-hmm. but they get results. <laughs> oh, the team was gathered. They're literal tigers. <laughs> <laughs> they're mauling people. With a whiteboard. They, let them, they let, <laughs> let them go on flight control and they're just running around, like jumping on the computers. Give them time. Give them time. This is their process. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen a mission they haven't saved yet. <laughs> This is also their first mission. <laughs> so, oh my god! This is a gamble. <laughs> I've mauled six men. <laughs> the team was gathered, and Chief Flight Director Gene Kranz gave them a pep talk, saying, "It's all good. We've got a plan. We're going to use the return to Earth trajectory. The crew will be in the lunar module until just before re-entry to Earth. They'll fire up the command module, get back into that, which is designed to safely re- re-enter Earth's atmosphere. Piece of piss." He's like, "Easy. Don't even stress. In fact, everybody knock off." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We got it. Yeah, we got it. Tiger team. I know you just got here, but uh, hey, let's call it a half day. Yeah. Tiger team out. Tiger team. <laughs> Disassemble. Uh, but 27-year-old flight controller, John Aaron, <gasps> a certain steely-eyed missile man. John Aaron's there again. Raised his hand and interrupted the most senior flight director at NASA and told him what he's saying is impossible. The batteries usually used for re-entry don't have enough energy to power, back up the now offline command module and keep it alive. Gene Krantz decided on the spot that John Aaron would be in charge of finding a solution. Just because he was like, you're actually wrong there. He's like, you're hired. You're hired, yeah. But I think what's really great about this is in looking into this, they weren't, they weren't afraid to put their hand up and say, this is a good solution. And I think they often back just the best idea in the room rather than, I'm the most senior, you don't talk out of turn yeah, to me. They're yeah, like, yeah. what's this? Yeah, unlike last week's episode where someone solved it and they're yes, like, uh, and they're no. ignored. Was it Helen? Yeah, Helen, Helen, Helen and Jensen was like, yeah, it's right. the Tylenol. And they're like, shut up, shut Helen. Up. Yeah, but in this instance, at least, they're, they're very much like. But they are all men, aren't they? Yes, I would say <laughs> that if Helen put her hand up, they'd probably tell her to leave. Get out of here. <laughs> what are you doing here? You don't work for NASA. This is not for coffee, ladies, they'd say. So John Aaron's in charge of uh, finding a way to keep the power going. First of all, he says they need to turn nearly everything off on the ship. Okay. The first problem was to find well, out. My big screen TV. Off. What about my PlayStation? Well, that's fine. What about my mini fridge? Okay. <laughs> Essential things are fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I have to turn the TV off, but I can have the PlayStation yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. It's pointless without the one or the other, Dave. Damn it, you're right. <laughs> Damn it, you're right. The first problem was to find out what if the essential things on board needed power. This caused big arguments between the different departments of engineers that all insisted their instruments were the most essential. Yeah. They're like, I do the life support. They're like, I do the oxygen. I do the navigation. They're all, and John Aaron has to be like, it's only the super essential stuff. Yeah, yeah. Life support. Uh, yes. I know you th- it, it probably sounds essential, but yeah. we don't have power for that. Yeah. Oxygen. Oxygen feels essential. Yes. That's one of the few things. There's okay. also concerns that the lamb only has What about enough- my LED light strip that uh, yes, that's changes fine. color? Yes, but make sure it's purple because that's my favorite. Me too. There's also concerns that the lamb only has enough power to last one day and the journey home will take at least three and a half. So the decision is made to turn off and power nearly everything down to conserve power, including the critical guidance computer on board that tells them where they are. So they're just going to go blind. Yeah, because battery power was just so critically low. They just had to sacrifice nearly everything. To get them back to Earth, Apollo 13 had the same amount of electricity used to power a coffee maker or a quarter of a modern-day microwave. Wow. Holy shit. That's all they were allowed if they were going to make it three and a half days. They've got to ration it. A quarter of a microwave. So they couldn't even microwave something with the power they've got, but this has to power a spacecraft 200,000 miles home. With three humans in it. Yes. Fuck! It's the same amount of power used for two car headlights is another way of thinking about it. That's all they've got to spread amongst the whole craft. Whoa. And if the battery dies, then so do all three men on board, and they know that. They've got to be very careful. Shit. And I guess they've probably got to keep the headlights on, otherwise, you know. Well, you're going to... No, no one will see you. Yeah. You might accidentally collect a, you know, a kangaroo or something. Exactly. At least put the, keep the low beams on. Yeah. So you see the kangaroo at the very last second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, there's a... Pfft. 
<laughs> so they have to turn off nearly every system. There's no lights, no navigation computer, no propulsion system, and the heaters were all turned off. And it's fucking cold up there. Oh, my God. It was freezing as they coasted through space in the dark. Fred Hayes on board said said it was uh, mid-30s Fahrenheit, which is about two degrees Celsius. That's chilly. They're only wearing cotton bodysuits, so they put on all three sets of spare underwear. They have to keep warm. Got to keep your giblets warm. <laughs> yeah. And the two men destined for the moon put on their moon boots. I don't think I've ever, ever gone, oh, I'm a bit chilly. Especially my butt. Mm, really? Really? You know? My feet get very cold. Yeah. So you um, put in the moon boots. You put on the moon boots. But there's only two sets of moon boots because remember only two of them are going Well, I the just moon. said my feet get cold, so I get the moon boots. Shock another moon boots. Sorry, Matt. Sucked in. Well, man. I don't have any moon boots. Well, you won't go into the moon. Yeah. I don't think my feet could fit into your little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got tiny moon boots. <laughs> your little moon boots. It's like little baby boots. Yeah, they're not moon boots. They're moon booties. <laughs> <laughs> It's also damp in there. Oh. There's lots of condensation, condensation on everything. And to add to the worries, debris and bits of frozen oxygen traveling travel along with them and it twinkles alongside and makes it impossible to see the stars to navigate and get an alignment because they just got little bits of shit twinkling on the outside. Sounds so pretty. It would be beautiful but a little bit scary. And with the guidance system offline, they're not sure even which way they're facing. Look out the window. Where's Earth? So weird. Yeah, because they need to be facing facing the right way. Because in, in space, there's no up or down. Or they're using kind of the moon to fling themselves back to Earth. So, and they've got to fire the rocket at the precise moment to get them back to Earth. So that makes that very hard. They, so they have to align themselves with the only thing that they can see, which is the sun. Oh, they can see the sun. Which is less than perfect, but it's better than nothing. And it was the only way to check Jim Lovell's hastily calculated ar- arithmetic that he'd entered into the computer before. Wow. Thankfully, the sun came around and it was where they'd expected it to be. Because imagine if it was Ooh. on the other side, you'd be like, oh, oh, no, we're facing the wrong way. Which is, would mean they were heading towards Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suppose so. They would have saved days of travel. No, I think it, they were probably just flying off into nowhere. Oh, okay. That would and be they'd bad. never come back. So they flew very close to the moon and Jim Lovell was pretty down as they flew by because, again, he was so close yet so far. Second time going past and he's not able to get down there. His fellow crew members who'd never seen the moon up close excitedly shot pictures of it, started filming it. And he was like, what are you guys doing? If we don't get home, you're never going to be able to develop those pictures. And they're like, it's so cool. Yeah, but if we do make it home, I can develop these pictures. Yeah. And, you know, and if we don't, I die and who cares? Yeah. <laughs> like, why are you being... Yeah. Shut up, Jim. Now's not the time to be a dick, Jim. Yeah. We've got three days of this. Jeez. On the ground, flight control have been doing some serious calculations and have come up with a plan to fire the lunar module's propulsion engine. Oh, no. It was his third day before <laughs> retirement. <laughs> They're going to fire it up for four and a half minutes to get them back on track towards Earth. Okay. They call this the PC plus two burn. Oh, that's a fun, snappy name. It's fun. <laughs> This burn would save time on their journey and would get them back to Earth half a day early and mean they're able to land in the Pacific Ocean where they've got a Navy boat stationed to pick them up. So that's ca- where I threw up. <gasps> in the Pacific? Yeah. Wow. You might have thrown up just where they were aiming for. Wow. This is about me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I find it amazing that they are able to choose like where they're going to land. Yeah, it's crazy. They're like, oh, if we calculate it, the earth will turn this bit and we'll land there. Wow. Amazing. Incredible. So far away. But I should add, it's just a theory because the LEMS thrusters aren't designed for this, but rather have been made with the intention to land the smaller lun- lunar module on the moon. Now it has to power the whole craft home. It's got much less thrust than the main engine that they're usually used to. Yeah, right. You want that big thrust. You want the big thrust. One big thrust. Honestly. That's all it takes. Yeah. For some of us. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, one small thrust. And Whatever. thrust and done. And good night. Sleep tight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That was, that was nice, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, Do you enjoy that? Yeah. Uh, anyway. Uh, catch you boy. <laughs> <laughs> Same time tomorrow? <laughs> So it's risky, but it's all they've got. And like a lot of things up until this point, they've just got to have a crack. Mm. They had time. They had to time it just right or they could blast off somewhere into space. So they do the burn and amazingly everything looks good. 
They look like they're on track. Sick. For a while. Oh. Oh. They're 230,000 miles and still at least 62 hours away from Earth when the master alarm starts to sound again. Oh, that's your alarm. <laughs> My alarm. <laughs> master alarm. Master Dave Warnock alarm. The environmental control system, their life support system, was alerting the crew that something was drastically wrong in the module. Turns out it's the level of carbon dioxide in the cabin. Carbon dioxide has built up with every breath out from the three astronauts. Oh. The CO2 exhaled stays in the cabin, poisoning the crew with their own breath. Wow, that feels like an oversight that they didn't think about that. Well, they must find a way to remove the carbon dioxide. Now, the lunar module has a system, but it's only designed for two people and for a short amount of time. Right. So basically, they're expelling CO2 faster than the system can mop it out of the air. Oh, so they've got to start breathing slower. They've got to hold their breath for 62 hours. Every. (laughs) So one of the three has to hold their breath at any one time. Yeah. Well, they're already extremely tired, cold and hungry and have to respond to the ground controls directions with extreme precision or risk making a mistake that kills them all. And they have to act fast because the CO2 buildup threatens to fog their thoughts even more and affect their judgment, which eventually would put them into a coma and kill them. Not a bad way to go. Yeah, I suppose so. As opposed to exploding. I don't know. Maybe maybe each are great. Maybe each are great. (laughs) How do you choose? They've all got pros and cons. (laughs) How do you choose how to die? Like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> Ooh, so many deaths. I'm overwhelmed. Can I get a bit of both? I just want to get a mixed bag of death. <laughs> Dave, to go on. Okay, so lithium hydroxide is used to remove the CO2. Carbon dioxide reacts to the lithium hydroxide, which sucks it out of the air as a fan blows through it. And they've got these cylindrical canisters of lithium hydroxide. A fan sucks in the air and then the CO2, when it goes through, gets taken out. But each of the canisters are cylindrical, as I say, and they can only co- they can only soak up so much CO two. Like charcoal in a water filter, it can only soak up so much before it becomes saturated. Mm. I heard a guy on the Smithsonian Channel say that. That's so funny that you were able to put it into terms that I could understand. <laughs> oh yeah, like okay, like charcoal in a water filter. Does that make sense to you? Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, in a similar yeah. sort of level that it did already. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, up in space, they're running low on the canisters. And doing the maths, there isn't enough for the rest of the journey. So this CO2 is only going to get worse before they die. NASA realizes that there are spa- spare lithium hydroxide canisters over in the command module next door. How convenient. But, of course, there is a problem. The modules were built by different companies. In the lunar module, they've got cylindrical canisters inserted into round holes, whereas on the command module, they've got square canisters that go into square holes. So they are not compatible. Okay. Mm. And an oversight as simple as this means the astronauts' lives again hang in the balance. So, again, they have to improvise and work out how to get a square peg to fit into a round hole. On the uh, ground. Uh, like like um, sand it down. Yes, yeah. hammer. hammer. Hammer it in. Believe. Step well, yeah. one. <laughs> Step two, okay. enjoy. I still think my idea was probably better than believe and enjoy. Okay. Are you sanding the hole or the uh, the canister? Good canister. Question. Yeah. Okay. What if you sand off so much that the CO2 just starts leaking out? That's not my problem. Can it fit through the? Thing? Well, I think it will be your problem. <laughs> but that's not what I was. That's not what I was instructed to do. I was instructed to get the square peg to fit in the uh, round that's hole. Good point. And well I've done. done that. You've done it, and your stubbornness means you die. Great! Congratulations! Great! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, sweet relief! So they've got to work out this problem. On the ground, another team was put together to solve this problem. Not a target team, just a regular team this time. Uh. They've, got to, they've got to come up with an adapter that the astronauts can use that will allow them to use the square canisters in the round hole. But, of course, they can only use items that are already with them in the lunar module. So on the ground, the engineers get out all the stuff that the astronauts have with them and just start experimenting, taping bits and pieces together. It's a real MacGyver moment. <laughs> Also, it so, sounds like a fun team building activity. Bit of a fun activity, isn't it? Yeah. They've got space Something suit. you do at like one of those, uh, I don't know, development days at a an office shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, make that, make that work. Let's work together. What do we learn from that? When we work together, we get stuff done. So yeah. you've got a chicken. Uh-huh. You've got a fox. Yep. And you've got a pig. Yep. And they're all in a boat. Uh-huh. On an island or something. Yes. Yep. You've got to get there and back. And, or you, like and that. then you've got to work out how that pig can get into that round hole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Well, pigs are kind of round. Yeah. Great. Great. Oh, so I would have thought you'd suggest to sand it down. No, I used my brain. Yeah. Interesting. I'm going to shove that pig through a hole. Yeah. 
Because it's already kind of round. <laughs> Jeez. That's actually so really cool. Sorry about that. Thank you. So they've got bits of shit on a table and they're like working out how to do go. it. They they've got stab. spacesuit bits and instruction booklets, cardboard, duct tape, a sock are all considered. They're like, they got socks up there. They thought about stuffing a sock into the hole around the canister and then duct taping it in place to be airtight, but it didn't quite work. Other parts were flown in from across the country on especially chartered flights as dozens of the world's most skilled engineers workshopped potential solutions, basically playing craft together. It took two days of experimenting and practice before they thought they'd found the correct solution. Wow. Then they, two days, wouldn't their air have run out? Yeah. By oh, it's getting worse and worse at, at all time. Crew Systems Chief Ed Smiley is the man who comes up with the solution using a plastic bag, some duct tape, the cardboard cover from the flight plan, and a hose from one of the spacesuits. The idea is the plastic bag is taped over the square canister to create an airtight seal. The hose is then fed into a hole cut into the bag, which is also sealed with duct tape, and then attached to a fan. This creates a vacuum that draws the oxygen through. Great in theory. But because NASA rarely leaves anything to chance, when the plan was decided upon, a procedure and a checklist had to be created. And then the Apollo 13 backup crew on Earth were given the instructions in a simulator to see if they could create the device. Meanwhile, the people up in space... Are dead. <laughs> They're like, the bad news, you're dead. The good news is we know how to save you three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, for next time. But it's not such a simple undertaking because the crew on board can't see anyone at NASA. There's no video link. Yeah. There's no way to send images. Can't well, you just FaceTime? Or- Unfortunately, oh, yeah. FaceTime is down. Oh. Fucking Apple. Oh, my God, what are the chances? All they're able to be given is a list of carefully written instructions and an astronaut on the ground, Joe Kerwin, is the one tasked with trying to guide them over the radio. Kerwin has he's practiced it himself over and over again. So that's, he, that's also like a, a team building exercise. Yes, describing like you can't him. see. I've got the plans and you've got the pieces, and I have to explain to you what to make. Yeah, that's a nightmare, honestly. And the instructions are also one step further removed because they're a relay. Kerwin on the ground radios to Swigert, who then repeats the instructions to Jim Lovell, who's got all the stuff. Right. right. So it's like yeah. I tell Matt and then you describe to Jess what to do with the bits and pieces yeah, over like there. Like a version of telephone or whatever. Yes. Like How similar. quickly would we have a breakdown <laughs> slash <laughs> argument? Ooh, pretty quick. Yeah, especially if I'm the one making so I'm going to snap at you real quick. All of Are you good at charades? <laughs> yes. Well, I think that would work. Okay, great. Because it's that only we can talk. Oh, yeah, okay. All, All right, right. It should be fine. It's a movie. It's The Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> Is it The Godfather? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we're nailing this. We're so good at this. <laughs> wow, we're great. <laughs> All of the transcripts have been published by NASA, so I'll read out some of the instructions. This is what Kerwin says. Pick up one of the lithium hydroxide canisters and let me describe which end is which. It's approximately square on one. One of the vented flat ends has the strap and that end we call the top. The other end opposite we call the bottom. Is that clear? Over? Yes. And then later on he says, I forgot to tell you to get something to stick in that hole. We recommend you either use a wet wipe or cut off a piece of sock and stuff it in there. Or you can probably even crumble up some tape and use that. Over. So <laughs> we got options. Getting a few options. Yeah. That is nice, actually. Love that. Forgot to tell you. Put something in there. It takes an hour, but they're able to build the device, which looks so homemade. They nickname it the mailbox. It's a box covered in tape with a cardboard book cover over the top and a host sticking out. I'll post a photo on our socials this week. That, I mean... I can't imagine how sweet oxygen would taste mm. if you ha- if you thought you'd never have it again. Yes. I mean, I have no idea. Much but. like when you're really thirsty or you haven't had a drink for a while and then you have a drink and you can feel it go down oh. yourself into your tongue and you feel it go all the way down, you're like, whoa. Ooh. I'd be chug-a-lugging that Enjoy. bloody oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't take it for granted right now. <laughs> yeah, how's that? <laughs> oh, Yeah. <laughs> Tastes good? Well, they're not safe yet Oh, because it's taken two days of testing to get to this point and by the time they have worked it out, the CO2 alarm, it's no longer going off. It's not flashing anymore. It's now on all the time. (laughs) Like when your petrol warning light just stays on, it's now all on the line. Things are desperate and they pray the device works. So they test it out and the CO2 begins to drop. It's worked. Yes. Oh, my God. So another problem solved you. Tick, tick, tick. They're on fire here. Not literally. Not literally. Think, what? Anymore. But they are freezing. They are hungry. They are thirsty and they are very tired from all the constant problem solving. Fred Hayes tells Mission Control he hasn't slept for 28 hours. Where are they now? Are they 
lapped the, lap the moon yet? They've lapped the moon and they're just about to enter Earth's gravitational pull, which will then speed the craft up towards its destination. First thousands of miles and then tens of thousands of miles, of miles per hour. This, Whoa, this keeps that's speeding up. fast. They're on the home straight. But Fred Hayes is not in a good way because he's also developed a urinary tract infection up uh. there. The ground crew worry that with the lack of sleep, the astronauts aren't themselves firing on all cylinders, something they'll need to do to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere safely. Because it turns out the hardest part might yet be to come. Oh, my oh God. God. Another problem comes up. NASA discovers that they're off course and will enter the Earth at too shallow of an angle, which means they would bump off the upper layer of the Earth's atmosphere. How oh, wild okay. is that? That's and then wild. You bump off and then fly off into space. Oh, imagine after end. doing all this, oh. you just get bumped off into space. I thought when you first said that, that they would bump off, they would knock off a layer of atmosphere, sort of fucking everyone over. Oh, no, they've bumped off one of our oh, layers. Good one. Great. Dickhead. Jeez. Thanks. Oh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. <laughs> watch where you're going. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Would you watch where you're floating, please? <laughs> please. Come on. Gosh. So they're a little bit off course. They've got to do another burn, this one for 14 seconds. They're forced to use Jim Lovell's wristwatch to keep time. I mean, yeah, that's, that's all what it's for. That's all they've got up there. They're forced to improvise they'd having to keep time with a watch. <laughs> but usually they're like, you know, it's very precise, and they've, but they've got nothing, everything's turned off. So they're mm. like, all right, I'll time it. The burn seems to go well, but with the lack of power on board, it also means there's a lack of data between the module and the earth. So it will be hours before they know if they're back on course or if they've made themselves veer wildly away. Oh. With a scale this large, even a tiny mistake could result in them missing the earth altogether, and they... Imagine was, that just slowly passing the earth. Oh, or no, actually close. very quickly passing the earth. No. Hours later, the data comes through. The burn was good. They're back on track. Oof. But then they've got the final hurdle, which could be the trickiest, the landing. Got to ah. stick the landing. And the oceaning in this case. Exactly. Now, the lunar module has served them well as a lifeboat, keeping them alive for a few days, but the, it's not designed to take the extreme forces of landing back on Earth, like I said. The re-entry, it will burn up. For this, the crew must get back into the much sturdier command module next door. Remember, though, the command module is dead, having been completely shut down, mm. something it's not designed to do mid-flight, and they're not sure if they can get it powered back up for re-entry. So now they have to hope to God that they have enough power to power it back up. Because yeah. what would happen if they, if it all failed, they just bounce they wouldn't go fast enough and they wouldn't be able to break through the atmosphere sort of Yes, they'd either go at an angle it's too shallow and they'd bounce off or th the other option is that the angle is not right and that it would get too hot and they'd even with the most protection you can have, they would burn up basically. Yeah. Wow. So you either bounce off or you burn up because you've got to get it exactly right. Oh right. My God. It's very precise. I don't like things that are very precise. Like a lot of baking and stuff, you have to be quite precise and I'm like, oh, too hard. Oh, piss off. Yeah, I like to wing it a bit. This is why I'm not an astronaut. Free poor. Yeah. Free poor Perkins, they call you. It's me. To make matters worse, Jess, normally the command module has three batteries used to specifically power it during re-entry. I mentioned those at the top because these were used in the early minutes after the explosion to keep everything powered up because they had nothing else. They went, oh, I'll use the batteries. So the batteries are drained. Usually they use that for re-entry. You got oh, jumper no. cables or something? Yeah, they need some cables. They just sort of kick that problem down the road a bit. Yeah, it's a future then problem. Yeah, that's right. That was four days <laughs> Four days ago. Yeah. Without the batteries, they can't control their re-entry, which needs to be extremely precise to stop burning up. Like I said, John Aaron, silly eyed missile man, oh my God. has to come up with a way to recharge the batteries. He spoke to the team rationing the power and worked out they'd been holding back a tiny bit of power for an emergency. And this, he says, this is the emergency. He finds a way to... No shit, John yeah, yeah, Aaron's. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you don't know. Let's save it. See if a bigger emergency yeah. comes well, up later. But that, he, he found that out. Like they were holding... Oh, oh, do you think we should... We were holding it for an emergency. He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this is this, it. I need, oh. I need this now. Thanks, John. Thank God you're here. <laughs> he finds a way to spread the power, which is equal to powering a hairdryer for two hours. That's Ooh. all it is across the system. That takes a lot. They take a lot. Yeah, of they juice, take so. a lot. Yeah, two hours right. is actually a really long time to be drying your hair. Yeah. As well. How long is this hair? Far out. What is this, buddy? Honestly, Rapunzel. It takes or? me like <laughs> right? less than ten minutes. That's a, that's a lot of time. You sit there drying your hair for ten minutes. Maybe. Why don't you just like leave it? Oh, you don't want to see it when I leave it. No. No. Nah. Well, all of a sudden, I want to see it when you leave <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. That's intriguing. 
So in order to achieve this outcome, he has to read out a series of very explicit instructions that involve dozens and dozens of switches being pushed in precisely the right order to keep the power at the right level. If they stuff it up, the battery would be stretched too thin and they'll lose power and then they will die. Powering up the command module before takeoff usually takes two or three days going through a checklist very Whoa, precisely. that's a long checklist. And no one has ever done it in orbit before. Now time is extremely against them. So on the ground, they joke that up in space, they'll have their instructions by Sunday or Monday at the latest. The joke being that they were due to touch down on Friday. What a fun joke. Bit of fun. You know how before you said that every problem they solved, the probability increased from 10%. What, what are they at now? It feels like 10% might have been overselling it back <laughs> yeah, then. Yeah, I think it was even less. It feels like by now they're at like 11%. Yeah, yeah that's why. Like, oh, yeah, I've gone up a bit, maybe up to 22% or something. 17 hours before touchdown, Commander Jim Lovell becomes frustrated because they haven't rated up the instructions and they can see the earth getting closer and mm. closer. But back at flight control, they're, all, they're dotting their eyes, crossing their T's, making sure everything's right. Because it's got to be, be perfect. Precise. Nerds. Finally, the, the power-up procedure is given to the crew. Ken Mattingly, who was meant to join the crew but was bumped due to measles exposure, was heavily involved with the procedure and read, read it out over the radio to his former He's crewmates. He's spreading rebella to everybody. Yeah. I'm guessing it turned out he didn't get it. He didn't get it. He didn't get it. Oh, and remember, he's the command module pilot and this is the command module. So this is, he's, yeah, this his, is his field thing. of expertise. Yep. Jeez, I wonder... Yeah, does he feel good or bad that he missed out at this point? I think point? he'd feel pretty good. I think <laughs> yeah. he'd feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm good. I'm okay missing out on this opp- this experience. Yeah, I'll take the next one. Had. Take yeah. the next one. But Tom Hanks isn't playing him or Kevin oh, Bacon's yeah, that's, not that's playing him. that's what would matter more to me, I think. Yeah, that's right. He could have had Kevin Bacon yeah, playing Yeah, he could have been stuck in a little module cold and hungry and pr- pretty sure you're going to die. He could have For had a couple that. of days. couple of days. <laughs> What's a couple of days? It's a couple. It's a blip. Yeah. I've heard the instructions that he reads out. It's very detailed. Jack Swigert, who replaced Madeline on board, takes note of the instructions and writes them on scraps of paper and on other manuals he can find. He must be careful to write down exactly the right instruction because they're not doing it step by step just yet. They're getting ready to do it the next day for entry. So that's why it's so important he takes careful note to go get everything in order. So you read it out to me, Matt. It's not like I'm doing it in real time. Yeah. I'm writing it down to do tomorrow. So I've got to write everything correctly in order. And he's doing it on scraps of paper. Far out. And I guess they're doing it ahead of time just in case they lose communication or... Yeah, and, and probably also you could probably ask questions like, right. what's that mean? Yeah. It takes two and a half hours to read out the instructions. And finally, Swigert thinks he's, he's ready. With the earth looming larger and larger, the crew have some much needed rest before the final challenge. Jeez. That'd have, geez, if you get to sleep there, you're doing pretty well, I reckon. Mm. But after that long, I suppose. Oh, you'd be knackered. Yeah, just doze off. So remember there's three bits that make up the, the craft. There's the lunar module that they've been sheltering in that's attached by a cylinder to the service module and the control module, which are one piece. They'll re-enter in the service module, but they no longer need the control module, which they jettison. They just break off a little bit. It's basically been a dead weight this whole time, mm. but they had to keep it there. And only when they jettison the module do they get a glimpse of the damage caused by the explosion. Ah. Before this, they only heard parts of it. They couldn't see it. And it's way worse than they expected. Uh. They see one whole side of it is missing. They basically see a panel blown off and basically a quarter of the spacecraft gone. I hope they're snapping a few Yeah, they, there's a photo of it, yeah. Wow. And I think that's what NASA bases a lot of their... Uh, investigation on the one photo and they can't believe what they're seeing it's way worse than than they thought seeing how much damage has been sustained a new worry dawns on them what if the heat shield the fiberglass and resin used to protect them from the 3000 degree temperatures of re-entry has also been damaged oh shit they're like we've got no idea oh shit it's designed to burn off in layers and keep the heat away from the astronauts inside any damage sustained could mean the system fails and the crew get instantly incinerated so they just have to hope Terrifying. After another 23-second burn, the crew are back on target and with two hours to go, it's the moment of truth. Can they power back up the command module in time for re-entry? And this process is going to take quite a while before they know it's worked or not? Yep. But like they can't do it they can't, until the very end. Yeah, but they can't do it too early because they don't have enough power. Yeah. So it's like, wow. oh, God. Swigert steps up and goes through his scribbled notes and checklist to get electricity flowing, flicking switches and powering things on in a very specific order, all whilst floating in the freezing conditions. 
It's so cold that there's condensation everywhere and the desk is wet with water. Oh, my God. He wipes it down but worries an electrical fire could break it. But also they only had half a cup of water to drink, so would you just not collect it? Just start licking. Yeah. Um, I'd lick it up. Licking instruments. Yeah, you just put a plastic bag around the gum leaves or whatever, like you do in the bush. Yeah, like you do in the bush. (laughs) And you just drink that water then. Put the plastic bag around the gum leaves. It's easy, idiots. And Jack Swigert has to do it alone as John Aaron's procedure calls for the radio to be switched off to save power. So that's another reason that it had Maddenly already gave him the instructions. They can't be on the radio at the same time. They've been listening to K-Rock the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so down on Earth, they're like just in a blackout being like, I hope hope it's going well. Hope it's going well Fuck. out there. Thankfully, nothing shorts out. Swigert does everything perfectly and electricity starts to flow through the command module. Whoa. He's able to turn the radio back on and pass on the good news. They're back, baby. Holy shit. Now the command module is back online, running on battery power, they must jettison the lunar module that has been their refuge for three and a half days. Oh, that'd be emotional. That'd be a bit sad, wouldn't yeah. it? No, they grabbed a couple of souvenirs. Bye, house. <laughs> Jim Lovell took an optical sight, which is the thing you'd lined up where they were. Fred took some netting. <laughs> Fun. Good on you, Fred. Feels like the end of The Wizard of Oz sort of thing. You get a And netting. <laughs> <laughs> you get some netting. <laughs> And then they jettison the lamb. Back at NASA, Joe Kerwin speaks for everyone and says into the radio, farewell, Aquarius, and we thank you. Oh, that's beautiful. That's nice. Because it's time for poetry, you know. From the heart. Don't cry, Matt. Sorry. It's okay. That was emotional. I, um... No, it's embarrassing when you cry. Stop it. Oh, yuck. Yep. Don't feel feelings. Yep. <laughs> now, all three men are back in the command module. They're only one hour away from the upper atmosphere of the Earth and they don't know, but the world is watching. Oh, finally. Oh, <laughs> yes, I okay. Finally flicked on. <laughs> Whilst no one Fuck cared sake. enough to, to about the mission to carry Jim Lovell's tour of the module, since the explosion, Apollo 13 has become massive news around the world and now millions tune in across the planet to watch their risky re-entry. Yeah, that's not Great, wild. thanks for watching this. Thanks for watching When We Might Die. Thanks heaps. In the USA alone, up to 70 million people tuned in for the re-entry. Pope John Paul VI led a congregation of 10,000 people in praying for the astronauts' safe return. Ten times that number offered prayers at a religious festival in India. Wow. The United States Senate on April 14 passed a resolution urging businesses to pause at 9 p.m. local time that evening to allow for employee prayer. I mean, who's working at 9 p.m.? Not many people. Yeah, prayer power. I wonder if the prayers got it done. Let's find out. They start the re-entry. And during this part, the astronauts actually face backwards towards the moon that they came so close to landing on. They're traveling at eight kilometers per second at this point. That's fast. And everyone has to hope that all the calculations have been spot on and the heat shield hasn't been damaged. They then enter what is known as the blackout. The time where the module is so hot, it's surrounded by a wall of fire that blocks any radio signals coming in and out. Never heard of this before. I think it's amazing. NASA can calculate to the second when this blackout starts and when it should stop. They they calculate that they'll lose contact with the crew for exactly three minutes. But after three minutes, they don't hear anything. This has never happened before. Usually it's exactly precise. If it's going to be two minutes 18, they go bang. After the two minutes 18, they start talking again. But the blackout this time doesn't stop as predicted. They hear nothing. Ten seconds goes by. Imagine they're thinking the worst. 30 seconds go by. They start to worry at this point. Are the crew still alive? A full minute goes by. It seems to last an eternity, and I think everyone in Mission Control is like, oh, shit. Finally, after one minute and 27 seconds, they hear on the radio Jack Swigert say, okay, Joe. Oh. <laughs> they are alive. Next up was the deployment of two sets of parachutes. They're worried that they might be frozen. They deploy perfectly and the mission control erupts. Their men are safe. Oh, oh my God. Imagine if the parachutes fail oh, right no. at the very end. You made it all that way. You travelled hundreds of thousands of miles only to wow. have your parachute. Even more incredibly, Apollo 13 splashed down in, into the Pacific Ocean just south of Samoa was one of the most accurate in the history of the Apollo program. No kidding. <laughs> that was, they were just four miles away from the Iwo Jima naval ship designed to pick them up. Four miles, easy peasy. Four miles. They get into the life raft, 
Jim Lovell, the commander of the ship, making sure that he's the last to leave. In his own words, the commander is always the last to leave a sinking ship. Well, not in recent stories. No, not in South Africa. (laughs) He also described the total surprise that met him because they don't know that people have been following their story. This is from Jim Lovell. Nobody believes me, but during this six-day odyssey, we had no idea what an impression Apollo 13 made on the people of Earth. We never dreamed a billion people were following us on television and radio and reading about us in banner headlines of every newspaper published. Only when we reached Honolulu did we comprehend our impact. There we found President Richard Nixon and NASA Administrator Dr. Payne to meet us, along with my wife Marilyn, Fred Wife's Mary, who being pregnant also had a doctor along just in case, and Bachelor Jack's parents in lieu of his usual airline stewardess. <laughs> <laughs> what a sledge! Uh, absolutely. Oh, Jack's folks are here. Not one of his uh, floozies. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's also it's funny adding the detail of like, well, his wife was pregnant, so she did have a doctor with her uh, just to get It's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Yeah, okay, okay. But yeah, in Mission Control. Just imagine, oh, just <clears throat> not knowing that. Did, did, we, did you mention that before? But the whole time... Been pregnant, waiting for your partner to hopefully come oh back alive. God. Oh my god, terrifying! I mean, I, full honestly, on with, with or without the pregnancy. Yes. But. Honestly, if I was pregnant and my partner was like, "I'm just going to pop to space for a bit," I'd be like, "No, you're fucking not. <laughs> I don't care that it's your dream. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. They've gone out the window. You're staying in this house. Be your parents. Yeah. And and you know what? Uh, actually. You want to go on an adventure? I feel like it's some pickles and a donut. So why don't you go get those and get that stupid idea out of your head? Okay, great. See you soon with pickles and a donut. <laughs> They're the kind of cravings you reckon you'll get? I don't know. Pickles and a donut? Never know. They're the kind of cravings I get now. Mm, now I want a donut. Are you pregnant, Matt? I'm starting to wonder. <laughs> uh, back at Mission Control, they had their traditional celebration, cigars all round. Oh, my God. Hundreds of them all lit up their official mission cigar at the same time. Official mission cigar. <laughs> I hate that. Good on him, but uh, President Richard Nixon awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom to the Apollo 13 crew shortly after the conclusion of their mission. They received multiple bravery awards around the country and were given various honorary doctorates. All three men are inductees of the International Space Hall of Fame. Wow. Their mission was classified as a successful failure because of the experience gained in rescuing the team. Wow. What a what a positive spin yeah. on it! Mm. Look hey. at how look at how much we learnt. And isn't that part of the journey? Yeah. Jim Lovell retired from the Navy and the space program on March first, nineteen seventy three, and went to work at the Bay Houston Towing Company in Houston, Texas, taking on the role of CEO in nineteen seventy five. He became president of Fisk Telephone Systems in nineteen seventy seven, and later worked for Centel Corporation in Chicago. Retiring as executive vice president on January 1st, 1991. Okay, so he did all right. In 1999, the Lovell family opened a restaurant in Lake Forest, Illinois called Lovell's of Lake Forest. The restaurant displayed memorabilia from Lovell's time with NASA and the filming of Apollo 13, the film. (laughs) It closed in 2015 and the memorabilia was auctioned off. As well as the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he is a recipient of the Congressional Space Medal of Honor. He co-authored the 1994 book Lost Moon with Jeff Kluger on which the 1995 film Apollo 13 was based. Tom Hanks, of course, played him in the film. The biggest honour, according to Matt. I think so, yeah. (laughs) America's father. You're right. America's daddy. And Lovell was featured in a cameo appearance in the movie, appearing as captain of the recovery ship USS Iwo Jima. Director Ron Howard had intended to make him an admiral but Lovell himself, having retired as a captain, chose to appear in his actual rank. That's fun. That's, That's nice. That cool? I like that. His wife, Marilyn Lovell, also made a cameo appearance among the spectators during the launch sequence. He's still alive, age 94. No way. And when he spoke to the BBC in 2020, he was asked about what it was, it was like looking back 50 years later. He said in trademark understatement, looking back on my life, I can leave it with a sense of achievement, inadvertently perhaps, Somehow I happened to step into the right spot at the right time and be thankful that I can look back and say, hey, I did it. I accomplished a little bit of something unusual. (laughs) (laughs) Jesus. Uh, Then we have uh, Jack Swigert, who was played by Kevin Bacon. He's shown as a bit slightly gung-ho and 
a little bit inept in the movie, but I read that in reality he basically wrote the manual for the command module. So this was just Hollywood exaggeration. That would okay. be frustrating. <laughs> yeah. This guy doesn't know what he's doing. Yeah. He's just fluking it. He's he, like, no, I'm very good at what yeah, I do. Yeah, no, actually like, people consult me about the safety of this craft. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He ran for a political office a couple of times after the mission. Oh. It's actually quite a common thing that I found for US astronauts to seek political office after they retire. That's interesting. Swigert ran for Congress in Colorado and was elected, but tragically he had died from cancer just a week before taking office. Oh. oh, man. And he was only 51, so he never got to see Kevin Bacon. Oh, okay. So that's okay. <laughs> you can, yeah. That's the right speech, then. someone's name. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, whatever. Got Fe- family who. Yeah, I think that's fine. Whatever. <laughs> 15 astronauts, including Apollo 13 crewmates, Jim Lovell and Fred Hayes, were among the thousand mourners at his full military honoured funeral in De- in Denver and he was honoured with a flyover from the Colorado National Guard. Wow. Fred Hayes went on to fly five space shuttle approach and landing tests in 1977 and retired from NASA in 1979, after which he became a test pilot and executive with Grumman Aerospace Corporation, where he remained until he retired in 1996. He's also still alive, wow. age 88, and was played by Bill Paxton. Wow, that's that's pretty cool that, that two of them are still alive. Yeah, I was wondering if there were any long-term health effects of, of the ordeal, but it sounds mm. like not yeah. that negative. But no. Anyway. Two or three are still alive and lived very long very lives. Very long lives, yeah. Ken Mattingly, who was taken off the mission due to being exposed to measles, later flew as command module pilot for Apollo 16 and made 64 lunar orbits making him one of 24 people ever to have flown to the moon. Wow. So he got there. Well, I'm During, happy for Ken. Good on him. During Apollo 16's return flight to Earth, Mattingly performed an extravehicular activity EVA, which is where you actually do a spacewalk on the outside, Oh. to, to retrieve film cassettes from the exterior of the spacecraft, the command and service module. It was the second deep space EVA in history Whoa. at great distance from any planetary body. He's still alive age 86 as well. Wow. So he's, that's kind of cool. And he's played by Gary Sinise and in, terrifying. The, in the movie. Oh, yeah, so that's my report on Apollo 13. I just want to say if people want to find out more, um, there's a fantastic podcast made by the BBC called 13 Seconds to the Moon. Second season of that is awesome, was, uh, is about this, and you can check that out on the BBC web, website or podcast app or a documentary I loved called 13 Factors That Saved Apollo 13. And if you just want to watch the Hollywood movie, it's awesome. I loved it. I haven't seen it, I don't oh, think. It's really, really good. The thing that blew my mind about it is, so it was made in 1995. That is closer to the time of the disaster than we are to that movie now. <laughs> yeah. More time has passed since the movie. That's Holy hectic. shit. Well, it was only 25 years after the disaster, but 27 have passed since the movie. Wow. So I was like, what the hell? <laughs> That's pretty cool. So, yeah, but that is um, our report on Apollo 13. Well done, Dave. Honestly. Well done, Dave. That's right. I think that word count wise, it's my longest report ever. So you've got to pull these things out for block. Oh, you do. I wasn't sure what was going to happen because I couldn't remember if it was a disaster. Well, I mean, it was a disaster, but if it was like if they all died. Um, and honestly, it was ruined when you said he wrote a book about it. Um, oh, you didn't know. No, I didn't know. So that was very exciting. Maybe edit that bit out, Dave. For the no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, very exciting stuff. What a story. Well done, Dave. A successful failure. I love it. That's, that could be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> what a fantastic report that was, Dave. Loved hearing about Tom Hanks and what he got up to. Yeah. What a guy, Tom Hanks. I love Tom Hanks. And before we move on to everyone's favourite section of the show, uh, Christmas is coming up soon. Krishmish, as you might say. Mm-hmm. And we have a tradition of sending out a Patreon Krishmish postcard. Uh, and if you want to get involved in that, if you want to have one delivered you know, pending your local post system. That's yeah. right. We will definitely send it to you, whether it arrives. That's that's, 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 that's that's out of our hands. That's right. We believe the vast majority arrive. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. we've, sent, we've sent one to every continent except Antarctica. Um, and they've, I think at least one on every continent's made it, right? Yeah, I think that's... People sent us photos from Japan and stuff and I South Africa with them. A lot of, uh, yeah, like the vast majority of them do make it. But yeah, we do uh, hear sometimes that they arrive two or three years late. But, um, <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? Well, like 98% and of them And what a way to incentivise people. <laughs> <laughs> you can edit any of that out that you think might put people off, Dave. Uh, but if you want to be involved in that, uh, sign up on the Patreon at patreon.com slash 2 pod. 
at the arse prod level, the associate producer level. Mm-hmm. and um, Or above. Or above. Or Everything above, above yeah. every, at that level and everyone above, we will send anyone in the world a Krishmish card. That's right. And while we're talking about Krishmish, we're doing our eighth annual Krishmas episode this time like it has often been it's live live this time at Comedy Republic on the 3rd of December remember remember the The 3rd 3rd of of December December. now people will never ever forget and that is if I'm not wrong a Saturday night big Saturday night 6.30 an early show come along get festive and then afterwards you can go out for dinner Uh, in the city I can't wait for that I freaking love Christmas I don't know if you know that about me I finish work at 6 p.m. on Saturdays, so um, it's exciting for listeners. I guess make a game of it. Will you beat Jess to the venue? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> probably. Yeah, probably. Probably, probably. yeah. Probably. Will Dave and I beat you there? Hopefully, because someone's got to set someone's up. Gonna someone's got to set up. I'll be there. Don't and worry. It, it won't be me, because I will be at work. We'll be on stage waiting with our Christmas hats on, <laughs> and as you run into the venue, we'll say, hello and welcome <laughs> to another Christmas special. <laughs> and while we're telling people about things, my first ever stand-up special taping recording... Nailed that. ...is uh, going to go out live on the Stupid Old Channel online for free. Uh, and it's going to be premiered if you want to watch it with me and others... Uh, on the Stupid Old Channel, Wednesday the 26th of October at 8pm Melbourne time. You're going to watch it live with the audience? No, well, I mean, just the, when you premiere something yeah, on YouTube, yeah. something that I've, we've done together before. Many times, yeah. You can chat along. You can chat along. Yeah, yeah. yeah doing that. I probably won't be watching, but I'll, you know, I'll be in yeah, the great. chat. No, but be in the chat and be like, just wait for this punchline. Here it comes. Wow, wasn't that great? And, then, that. and then I'd be like, oh, yeah, I should have written a punchline for that bit. <laughs> yeah. Sort of just fades out a bit, doesn't it? It'll be it? fun. It's like live commentary. <laughs> so that's the 26th of October. Remember, remember the 26th, 26th of, October. of October. Remember, remember the 26th of October. And you can watch that and get pumped up because you can see Matt live in the UK with me also doing stand-up and our podcast, Book Cheat, and Who Knew It with Matt Stewart and a little tour we're doing around the UK in November. Starting on the 8th of November, running through to the 20th. And between those two dates, we'll be in Birmingham, Glasgow, Leeds, Manchester, Bristol and London. I don't think they say between over in the UK. They say betwixt. Betwixt Betwixt those dates. Betwixt the 8th of November and the 20th of November. (laughs) Of those locations, Mm -hmm. um, how many can I expect a magnet to be brought back from? Oh, well, um, I guess that depends on... How many magnets the audience members bring yeah, you want to, bring to give you? Oh, great. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I'd welcome that. They bring gifts to give to you. I love it. Yeah. We'll bring one spare bag, an empty <laughs> bag with us to fill with. If you have any gifts that you want to <laughs> give to, to me, you cannot do it in person, unfortunately, um, as I will not be there. But you can pass them on to my bag boys and uh, <laughs> they will bring it home for me. I absolutely promise we'll do that for you. Thank you. Jess, you are, If of you want to bring things that um, are a biohazard and you want to get Dave pulled over in security, right. feel free. Oh. I'm talking dirt. <laughs> I'm talking... Bananas. Clippings <laughs> from plants. Oh, batteries. Batteries. Yeah, I'm talking food. Bag definitely. of acid. Bag of acid. If you want to give Dave a flimsy plastic bag of acid... <laughs> Please Carry on free. only. <laughs> Somehow he gets through security and then you've got a Then I've got Jess. a bag of acid. That's that will be karma. Oh, I feel like such a fool. Uh, Jess, you, I mean, obviously the invitation's still there for you to come with us. Are you still thinking about it? I, I, I never said no. Um, um, but the tickets were booked. Um, no, no, no. I have a, I have <laughs> do a, I have a job, unfortunately, that I do not have enough annual leave. Hey, but don't worry. We'll be bringing those magnets back for you. Yes, that's all I ask. And bags of acid. So yeah, just to <laughs> recap, if you would like to receive a Do Go On Christmas card, make sure you join the Patreon. Do go, um, Patreon.com forward slash Do Go On Pod by the end of October. We need a bit of time to get them to you. So by 31st of October is the cutoff. Halloween. That's the spookiest Ooh. day of the year. Oh, my goodness. Spooky. And, yes, we have Christmas shows. We have a UK tour. All of that information is on our website, dogonpod.com. All right. Now, that brings us to everyone's favorite section of the show uh, where we get to just spend a little bit of time with our fantastic supporters. Uh, and if you want to be a supporter, you can go to patreon.com slash dogonpod. And, yeah, there's a bunch of different levels. Uh, Dave, what are some... 
things you can get involved with if you're there. Different levels, different rewards. Some of them include you get to vote on topics. Two out of the three topics are voted for by the Patreon supporters. So you get to steer what we talk about on the show, of course. Uh, you can join a Facebook group, which is very, very lovely. Honestly, it's just the only nice bit about Facebook for me. <laughs> um, you can uh, get three bonus episodes a month as well as access instantly to the back catalogue, which is now over 150 bonus episodes. There's reports, there's quizzes, there's Who Knew It's with Matt Stewart. Mm. There's all sorts of things on there. And, of course, Phrasing the Bar. That's right. And uh, now, if you're involved on any level, you can submit questions for Who Knew It with Matt Stewart as well. Uh, unless you just said that. I was distracted by Jess's dog. <laughs> Did oh, you say I that? didn't say that. Bit, okay, so fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> he was so quiet and playing peacefully until we started recording. And now he's like, I'm going to throw this loud toy. <laughs> he's like, oh, mics are on. Crap. Around the room a lot. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the first thing we like to do uh, for one of our great supporters or the levels is the Sydney Scheinberg level. If you're involved on that level, you get to give us a fact, a quote or a question in the section that I like to call fact, quote or question. And as a jingle goes something like this. Fact, quote or question. Ding. Always remembers the ding. Always remembers the jingle. And uh, yeah, get involved via Sid- the Sydney Scheinberg level. Then you get to give us a fact, quote, or question, or a brag, or a suggestion, or really whatever you like. One week, someone gave us a recipe. Uh, and you also get to give you, uh, yourself a nickname or a title. And uh, this week, the first one comes from Andrew, but I go by Andy Swibes. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Andy Swibes has given himself the title of. Senior Junior President of I Drive Near or Through Gary a Lot Because I Live in Chicago. <gasps> ah, the Windy City. Wow. What a privilege to drive near or through uh, through Chicago, obviously, and also through Gary. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I wouldn't drive through it. I'd drive into it and remain there forever. Forever. <laughs> I would die there. I would die there. I would live there first. Well, according to reports, For I a think long that might time. be true. Yeah. No, I would live there a long, happy life, and yeah. then I would die there of an old age and Thank goodness. Um, in my age. sleep. Yeah. Peacefully. Yeah. And everyone would say, well, I'm glad she loved her time in Gary, India. <laughs> <laughs> and Andrew has, o- oh, sorry, Andy Swabs mm. has offered us a brag, which is this. This may come as a shock to, f- uh, this may come as a shock to you, but I drive through Gary, Indiana frequently. Oh, you gave a lot of this away yeah. in your title. <laughs> uh, in fact, I posted on the Facebook page that I was able to see my niece at her first Railcats game. Oh, Wait, what? I got to see my niece at her... As in she played for the Railcats? Keep reading. Up. Yeah, maybe okay. you'll get answers. Can't wait for the pod to come to Chicago. <laughs> no, okay, you won't get answers. I happen to know a ton about Chicago and that bit of Indiana in and around Gary. That's my favourite bit of Indiana. Wow. If you have any questions, if and when you come. Cheers, Andrew. Sorry, Andy Swabs. I thank you. Wow. You have brought a little joy... To uh, this old man. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And your niece may play for the Gary Indiana Railcats. I reckon Railcats. maybe they... That's just the first game she went and saw them. I reckon. That's my guess. Either way, fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Andy Swabs. This one comes from Tessa Chilcott, uh, aka really running out of imagination. So, <laughs> when my mum would go through a lot of different cousins' names and my sister, uh, before getting to my name, she would say... I live, no, hey, no, Immy, no, wait, Tessa. <laughs> <laughs> I used to hear that from my mum. used to uh, go, give it, Tom Matt. Yeah, tomato. To Matt. <laughs> this is what, kind of what I thought my name was for a while. Uh, and Tessa's given us a quote. This quote is, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. Oh, Jess, maybe that's something that you could keep in mind when dealing with your dog. <laughs> and that quote comes from one and only Benj Eamon Frank Lyon. Wow. My favourite poet. Benj Eamon Frank Lyon. Yeah. Is, Any relation? Is, ben, is he, was he a president or was he an inventor? No, not a president, but an inventor. Inventor. Well, but also like a founding confused. father. Figure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so they, you can see why I get mi- mixed up. Yes, yeah, so I think people frequently, and I think he's on. He's on he's money, on like on money. That's yeah. right. Benjamin's, Benjamin's they're hundred dollar bills, probably, or ten dollar bills, depending on. I think it's people say spending Benjamins. <laughs> oh man, he's on the hundred. Hundred. Wow. Wow. Who's? Jeez, Louise. Who, who am I hearing talking about money? 
Probably in movies. It oh, couldn't be people must, you know. Must be in movies. Nobody yeah. we know would have hundred dollar bills. Probably pop stars. Yeah, they'd probably They're sleep probably, on Benjamins. Yeah, swimming in them. <laughs> must be nice. Probably bored of them. Must be must nice. Must be very very <laughs> nice. Uh, thank you, Tessa. Fantastic quote. Next one comes from Nick Fidian, aka Master of Forgetting to Submit a Fact Quote or Question. Mm. Uh, Is that true, Nick? It's tough. I mean, yeah, it's all sort of like a. Sort of like a contradictory title there, as this is you doing that thing. Mm, interesting. Hmm. Huh. Huh. Makes you think. Lies. <laughs> uh, Nick's asking a question, writing, I keep forgetting to submit these, and then when I go to, I struggle to think of something and then fear that I'm going to end up submitting something I or someone else has already submitted before, especially if it's a fact. With this in mind, what is your go-to fun or interesting fact? Oof. Mine, he goes on to answer his own Love question. Love that. I'm a Thank big you. Fan of. Thank you. Mine, uh, which I think I've submitted before, is that in the time it takes to listen to 500 miles by the Proclaimers, the International Space Station will have travelled 500 miles and then 500 more. Get absolutely fucked. I don't, if, if you've told us that fact before, I don't recall I've it. I've never heard that fact in my life and I love it. I love it Are too. you kidding me? Because I love that song. La da da da. Lot of fun. <laughs> La da da da. That's right. <laughs> Every time they say that, they've travelled like thirty la la miles. La da da. That's crazy. Wow. That's so good. Nick Fidian, fantastic. Thank work. you, Nick. Here's the thing, Nick. You're worried about submitting something that other people already have, or that maybe you haven't before. That doesn't mean I'm remembering it. In fact, I definitely won't. So every new fact you tell me is new to me. Yeah. That's right. Someone recently posted in the Patreon group, oh, they read out my fact two weeks in a row and didn't even notice. <laughs> we did, though. <laughs> did we? We, yeah, did. No, we did. We, we did. did. I did, actually, surprisingly. We, we Yeah, we, we, we recalled it. Um, we, we were both saying, whoa, <laughs> what is it, not nostalgia? Deja vu. Deja vu. Um, and, but that, to that end, Nick, I don't have a go-to fun fact because my – Memory is shit um, So I can't even Like on the spot I can't think of a fun fact The fun fact I think of But can't really recall Was <laughs> given in the fun fact For quote a question section A year or two ago And okay. it was about Dave Maybe you can And I think It was about me No it, was about it wasn't Dave. about you But it was about time And I think maybe It was something like What you mentioned in the Seven wonders of the world thing Oh Cleopatra on the iPod That's the yes. one I was thinking of yes. right then So uh, Cleopatra was born Closer to the invention of the iPod than the creation of the pyramids of Giza. Fuck. She's closer in time to us now. That's, yeah, that's wild. I thought of that too when he said fact. I was like, because that's the most recent one I've said. Here's a fact. You're like, I've got one. It's funny because I, I could remember the pyramids. I could remember Cleopatra. And I remember that it was something about time. And that's not enough to say out loud. <laughs> it's not bad though, is it? <laughs> if you're at the pub, the people Cleopatra are throwing facts around. <laughs> the iPod, they're... Far apart, but not that far. I didn't even have the iPod bit, though. <laughs> right, you said Cleopatra and time. I just Time Googled. And, that's pretty good. I just Googled fun facts, and the number one that's come up is, it's impossible, impossible for most people to lick their own elbow. Most people, because I fucking can. You can so. do it. Yeah. Sorry I read over your shoulder there. I got excited. Another fun <laughs> fact that I think of sometimes is how wombats shit cubes. Oh, yeah, that is fun. Hmm. And the final fact quote question... Must hurt your asshole, hey, unless they've got square shaped... Must, ha- must hurt your asshole, hey. <laughs> every time I say hey now, I think because every time I do it, you do that. It's fun, hey. I love it. No, but it reminds me of when I was a teenager and I started saying like a lot. And every time I said like, my mum would go like. Oh, that's fun. And she sort of beat it out of me that way. So now... I'm not beating it out of you, I'm trying to beat it into you. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to copy me. You're trying to be like me. Is what yeah. Is how I'm choosing to take that. Trying to beat, beat it into me. <laughs> I'm trying to beat it into um. <laughs> Anyway, next. Uh, finally this week. Oh, inter- oh, this is an interesting one. I don't read these, so I read them. The final one comes from Dave Warnicky, open bracket, best host, close bracket. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I know Dave, have, have you signed up on the... I have. I support you. Do you guys support me? Yeah, in yeah, so many ways, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, well, Matt supports you emotionally. I physically carry you everywhere. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I hate stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's title is that he's given himself is definitely not a virgin. Wow. And he's offered a brag. You're going to have to explain what's going on after <laughs> I read this out. I will. I will explain. Uh, 
The brag is, I promise I had sex at least one time, books forever. <laughs> it does sound like him. That I've heard him like say me. books forever. Does, and it does sound like me. I've definitely had sex. So this, that's, is you've that a fact? That's a fact? definitely said that you've had. No, that's a brag. Oh, fuck, should have been a fact. <laughs> Damn it. What was I thinking? Um, okay, I can explain what's happened to you. I was in uh, London not that long ago to do a one-off live book cheat. Uh-huh. And then after the show, uh, fantastic support of the show, Milton Keynes' own Ben Johnson uh-huh. came up to me and said, Will, would you fill out my next fact quota question for me? And oh. handed me his phone and it was like an so Android. So you did write that. Yes, but it was an Android <laughs> or a Samsung. I couldn't work out the keyboard. It was really stressful. So uh, I panicked uh, <laughs> and I thought of the only thing that I know 100% to be true and that is I am definitely not a virgin. Oh, God, but just the passionate, the passionate uh, defence... Damn it. It's so sus. So that is that is a brag from me, but also a fact from, from me. I honestly did some of that. Via Ben Johnson. Okay. Um, but what's the uh, the best host part of that? Yeah. That's interesting, that's isn't interesting. it? Maybe Ben wrote that bit. Oh, okay. Yeah, throw Ben under the bus. Ben did not write that bit. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. All right, well, that brings us to the next part of this section of the show where we thank a few of our other great supporters. Jess, you normally come up with a bit of a game based on the topic that we just talked about? Well, I think, um, I mean, there's so many amazing parts in this story. Obviously, our favourite part being the steely-eyed missile man. <laughs> John Aaron, what a guy. No, no, no. I don't, I don't ever need to remember his real name. He's a steely-eyed missile yeah. man. Um, what if we gave everybody a four-part nickname? Steely-eyed missile, missile man. man. Thank you, you for checking that. I'm sure you would have. You would normally say it's too cumbersome for a, yeah, a nickname. Yeah, it is. Nicknames should be short, but this is really more of a less of a nickname, more of an honorary title. Steely-eyed <laughs> missile man. But like, if you shorten it, it becomes Sim. That's cool. <laughs> hey, Sim. Steely-eyed missile, missile man. man. It's like sa- Sim. Yeah, I'd say Sam. So, I don't know how you're getting Sim from that. That's but Sim. Steely. Yeah. Eyed. How do you spell eyes, how do you Dave? Spell eyed, Dave? Uh, well, you didn't write the report. You didn't see it written down. <laughs> How's it written, Dave? I apostrophe D. Oh. <laughs> steely, I would missile man. That's what it's short for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do, do you mind if I kick us off here? Please. I'd love to firstly thank from Upper Chichester, <laughs> which I would have put a million dollars on being in England. No, it's in. Pennsylvania in the United States. I'd love to thank Nina and Brian Burkhart. Oh, some good names. Fantastic name. Nina um, and Brian Burkhart. Oh, it's already a four part. It's already, oh, it. already a four part. They've nailed it. So I guess we can <laughs> we can leave the and in there. Yeah. So what it, what it, that means we've got one word each. All right. Um, uh, r- rocket and. <laughs> no, you've got to do the. All right, rocket and. Watch. Gang. <laughs> rocket and watch gang. Oh, I like That's that. Good. Yeah, rocket and I, watch. I love I love two people being a gang as well. Yeah, I love that. Just, you know. Is that the bare minimum? Yeah, I think that's a, the very bare minimum. <laughs> the rocket and watch gang. Are we a gang? Yeah. From, from Upper Chichester. Up, we're the Upper Chichester. Yeah, we're a rocket gang. Rocket and watch are we gang. A gang. Yeah. I'd also love to thank from Palm Harbour in Palm Florida. Harbor. Palm Harbour. <laughs> in the United States, it's Tim Fisher. Tim Fisher, the... The ex-Deputy uh, Prime Minister, Tim Fisher, I wonder. The ex-Deputy ex Prime Minister. Minister. <laughs> 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 He's like, yes, that is my, that's uh-huh. my nickname. That's my title. Yes. That's what, yeah, well, that's, what, we're, that's what we're doing. We're doing real titles. I prefer former Deputy Prime Minister <laughs> yeah. rather than ex, yeah, but okay. Ex also sounds a little bit bad. Sort of like Olympians, like I'm not an ex-Olympian. I'm still an Olympian, okay? Yeah, okay. I guess that's true, yeah. yeah. All right, you've got the little tattoo on your arm to prove yeah, it. We, we get, get it. it. Beijing, baby, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Rio. No, I saw you in Atlanta. <laughs> cool. Awesome, you came ninth. <laughs> Top nine. Pretty good. Very, in the world. Uh, in honestly, the world. that is, that is quite okay. impressive, that is but really like, great. lose well the tune, you know <laughs> yeah. what I mean? Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, and finally for me, I'd love to thank from Liverpool in Great Britain, Ellie Bacon. Ellie, oh, great name. Ellie Bacon. Ellie Bacon. Let's see, how do you, let's go, get into your Liverpool accent there, Dave. Whoa. How, how do you do that? You go, well, I normally think of uh, someone impersonating Paul McCartney. Mm, mm. I'm thinking of Bacon. I'm thinking of the Buffet Breakfast Bandit. Ooh! Blink Blanca. Yeah, here we go. On the, on the, the, having a little twinkle on the keys there. Uh. Now say Buffet Breakfast Bandit. 
she's the buffet breakfast bandit. <laughs> That's good. That's good. I like it. That's great. Buffet breakfast bandit's fantastic. Best kind of buffet, I reckon. Oh, no, oh my a goodness. breakfast? Or I lie. No, yeah, it's much better than a dinner, I reckon. It sort of depends. As someone who doesn't eat eggs or bacon, okay. breakfast options are a little limited I get sometimes. Because what I like about the breakfast buffet... Is the bacon and the eggs. <laughs> well, no. <laughs> no, it's the fact that you know what you're going to get. Like, there's yeah. only so many things that are considered breakfast foods at a buffet. But at a dinner one, it could be anything. It's open to every That's cuisine. That's true, yeah, yeah. You get in there, you're like, oh, I don't really feel like Italian and Thai tonight. You know, yeah, there's yeah, too yeah. many options, but with breakfast... You know what you're going to get. Unfortunately for you, you know you're not going to like it. No, but, that's, but you know, sometimes there's like lots of nice fresh fruit mm. or a pancake station. Or a hash station. brown. Fuck all of a hash brown. You get sometimes you get a nice uh, range of cereals. Yeah, that's fun. Oh, yeah. Juices. Usually get apple, orange, maybe pineapple. Yes, that's and then, nice. Then there's grapefruit and I get tricked every time. I'm like, oh, <laughs> this looks sweet. Oh, oh God. Oh. <laughs> Whenever, I've, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about the one that we stayed at for the Thai podcast. That's festival. absolutely what I was thinking. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Take that me back. I tiny was... banana. Do you remember oh, that tiny little banana? banana I've ever seen. But my thing there was I would get bread, toast it, then I'd butter it with blue cheese as the spread. Oh and my then god! Butter bake... it with blue cheese and then baked beans I've on top. I've never heard something oh. so extravagant <laughs> before. Exactly. Oh. Freaking hell! It's all included. Buttered you... with blue cheese. You're no, losing money party. not to get it. Yeah, you're right. Hey, Jess, would you like to thank a few people? I would love to thank some people. I would love to thank from Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, 96. The toilet. toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to thank Alex. Oh, Alex from Atlanta. That's already good. Mm. Um, all right. So, Atlanta. Atlanta. I'm thinking of like the Falcons in the in the NFL. Mm-hmm. Okay. Or the, what, what, the Hawks in the... So, uh, there's, so there's a bird. The NBA, sort of it's a big bird. Yeah. So, what about something big bird? Like an aeroplane. Uh <laughs> Like, like an aeroplane bird. Oh, okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> that's good stuff. Like, or lab, for short, I'm getting that one right. Uh, like lab. Uh, aeroplane bird, yeah. Lab. Well, they'd say like an airplane bird. Airplane. Like an, air, like an airplane bird. <laughs> like an airplane bird. <laughs> that's good. It's like something from a theme song. Alex, yeah. you've got to be thrilled with that one. That is good stuff we've given you there. Steely-eyed missile man, like an airplane bird. It's Alex from Atlanta, like an airplane bird. Yeah. Okay. Well, if that That's wasn't good. enough, now you got a jingle. Yeah, got a exactly. Jingle. What more do you want from us? <laughs> Sometimes we go, we've got to give you a little bit more here. Yeah. <laughs> we should change it. We'll yeah, give you a little that, extra. That sucks. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, I love it. Like an airplane bird, Alex from Atlanta. <laughs> Uh, I would also have to thank from location unknown, Ooh. deep within the fortress of the moles, <gasps> Bradley Williams. Bradley Williams. Bra will. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Bra bill. Bra bill. Bra will support you. Bra will support you. Bra will support you. <laughs> bra will. Su- will. Bra will support you. Yeah, so you thinking? That's nice. That's <laughs> his nickname. It's nice. Yeah. Supportive kind of person. <laughs> bra will support you. Yeah. Like an airplane <laughs> bird, <laughs> bra will support you. That, that works. I think we've lost it a little Here bit. Here comes I, I the breakfast buffet bandit. I think we'll do better on the next one, I reckon. Bra will support you. No. Bra will support you. And then like in the cartoon, bra's got their hand out for a big shake. Bra, yeah. bra will support you. Bra. Yeah. Bra. <laughs> Just like that. Bra. Um, uh, so finally for me, I'd love to thank from Long Beach, California, Dennis. Ah, uh, the sexy sandy surfer son of a bitch. That's one word, that last bit. That's the one the word. The sexy sur- sandy, sandy surfer, surfer son, son of a bitch. bitch. Yeah. It's four, four words, No, not a shadow of a doubt. There's alliteration in there. Ooh. And it feels fitting to the location also. You know? Yeah. In California. Yeah. Did you mean That's that? A long beach. Did you mean yeah. that? And Dennis Dennis is actually spelled with four S's. Yeah. Like, what does that yeah. stand for? What's that? What? Dennis. Where's Dennis. <laughs> Where's that come from? Nice to meet you. Of course. <laughs> Bra will support ya. <laughs> <laughs> Dennis. <sighs> That's good stuff. So thank maybe you so much. it's time for you to jump in and thank you. I think, you. hey, I'd like to take you all the way from Long Beach to Oklahoma City. Oh, oh. Oklahoma. Okay. No See, in Oklahoma, it is. Adriana Gray. Adriana Gray. Now, Oklahoma City, is that am I right in thinking that's the Pelicans? No, no that's, that's New Orleans. That's Nola. Who's what oh the Thunder, of course. Yes. 
Josh Giddy's team. That's right. And R- Russell Westbrook used to play there. I knew it was Before one of the changing. slightly irrelevant teams. <laughs> <laughs> okay, see, oh, because um, you know they call it okay, see the the team. Um, okay, see, so, yeah, okay, so Giddy, I think, is already great. Uh, Gray, we've got so Giddy Gray, Ooh. the Giddy Gray Goose. It can finish it. What's someone to kick us off there? Oh, uh, the I guess the Giddy Gray Goose. Fuck yeah! <laughs> oh, the Giddy Gray Goose. The Giddy Gray Goose. G- Giddy Gray Geese. Is that <gasps> slightly easier to geese. say? Giddy Gray Geese, and that's Adriana Gray. That's good. When one goose isn't enough. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Flock of geese. That's again, Adriana Gray. Again, it's a gang. Yeah. Flock of, flock of geese. What's the collective noun is it, is for geese? Gaggle? What's gaggle for? Uh, yeah, it's ga- It's not. It's not. Gaggle collective something. Noun. Yeah, it's and that's another bird, but I don't think it's geese. Oh, fuck, maybe it's geese. Gaggle. It's gaggle. Gaggle. Apologies for I was so sure it wasn't, and I was like, you guys Hey, you looked idiots. it up. Don't worry. People haven't yelled too much. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Adriana Gray, love your work. And I'd also like to thank from Greatest of Britons in Enfield. Enfield, it's Elfie Hanks. Hello, I'm Elfie Hanks. Elfie Hanks. Hello, dear, I'm Elfie Hanks. How do you do? How are you doing, love? Any oh, relation? Elfie Hanks. To Elfie Hanks. To the great Tom man. Tom Hanks. No, to, to Colin Hanks. To Colin Hanks. <laughs> uh, I don't think so, no. Okay. Elfie oh, Hanks. I'm Elfie Hanks. I'm Elfie Hanks. All right, love. <laughs> All right, nickname. Toilet. Nick, nickname. All right, I'm Elfie Hanks. <laughs> That's good. You story. got Alfie Yanks in his nickname. Yeah, all right. Ooh, no. I'm Alfie Yanks. Jess was going down a great path here with toilet. Yeah, because you guys always call people toilets in that accent. It's fun to yell. Oh, you've, you've, shut your lid, you, you toilet. Shut your, your lid, the, you toilet. The, 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 the li- lid. The lid shut and toilet. The lid shut and toilet. What about the great lid shutter? The great lid yeah. shutter. I see a toilet, I'll shut that lid. Yeah. I'll shut all it right, down. All right, boys, you got to put the lid down. <laughs> all right. It's hygienic. It's also about respecting other people in the house. Yeah, that's isn't right. It? Yeah, you either keep it down or I put you down. <laughs> I'll sh- I'll shove your head in the toilet. <laughs> if the flush goes and the lid is up, you're spraying projectiles of all sorts of yuckiness all over the bathroom. <laughs> Our toothbrushes are out there. All right. All right. You have poo particles. Ever heard of them? You want brush your teeth? There. You want brush your teeth with poo particles? I didn't think so. <laughs> so let's close the lid, flush the toilet. That's right. Shut the lid, flush the toilet. All right. All right. I'm the great. Lid shutter. <laughs> all right, all right. Now what you say? Thank you, Alfie. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You're welcome. Another lid well shut. <laughs> Moving on. I'm the great lid shutter. I'm going door to door, knocking, <laughs> knocking on door, telling people shut their fucking shut. lids. Let's say it's you already shut. shut. Your it's already lid. shut. I'm so sorry, Alfie. It's already shut. <laughs> Prove it. Prove it. Prove Show it. me your toilet. Show me your lid. And then <laughs> while I'm in there, I rob them. <laughs> yeah. That's right. A man's got to eat. <laughs> I've got multiple used toothbrushes at home. <laughs> Sell them online. <laughs> Haven't had any tokers yet, yeah. but it's a slow process. Yeah. It's an economy thing. You get on the great lid <laughs> All right. All right. I'm Alfie Yanks. <laughs> so, yeah, that's Alfie. Um, thank you so much Thanks, for Thanks, Alfie. Sorry. We blacked out for a second yeah, there. Oh, hope, hope whatever we came up with was yeah. good. Did we give them a nickname? I don't yeah. know. Not sure, but well, we have to move on. And finally... <laughs> From Brisbane, back home in Australia, it's Leo McMonagall. God, that's a great name. Holy Monagall. shit, Leo McMonagall. Leo McMonagall. Fuck, that is good. Mc- it's fun to say, isn't it? McMonagall. 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 Leo McMonagall. Uh, LM. LCM. LMC. LMC. Snack? LMCM. LMCM. Because it's McMc. McMc. Oh my god! So M- LMCM. Okay, what, what could that stand for? What? Lots. No. L- l- ludicrously. Ludicrously. Mega. <laughs> clever man. Oh, oh ludicrously. ludicrously. What was the M for? Mega. <laughs> mega clever man. Ludicrously mega clever man. That's what they call me. That's or LMCM. Stuff. Yeah, you rang. Uh, Sorry, I uh, got a call. Uh, LMCM here. Ludicrously big. What did you... <laughs> clever man. You need something sorted out? I'm ludicrously... Mega clever. Mega clever, clever man. <laughs> you got a problem with yourself? I'm ludicrously... What do you need done? Get me in. Mega clever. Call me in. I'm here. I'll help you out. What's he- the problem? He'll be there. Like an airplane Play bird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to Leo, Alfie, Adriana, Dennis... 
Bradley, Alex, <laughs> Ellie, Tim, <laughs> Nina, and Brian. Uh, really appreciate your support. Great, Thanks so much. You're Great keeping the show bloody happening. I think that those nicknames truly rival the steely-eyed missile man himself. Yeah. I think they, they could be game changers for each of those individuals. Yeah, that's right. They're going to rebrand. I can see a few personalised number plates being printed up as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They'll need multiple automobiles <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to get them across their fleet. No one was from WA. Have you noticed over there they have like full sentences as their... No. I don't think there's a limit on the characters. That's fun. I haven't noticed so There that must before. be a limit, but it's more than the six that we get in wow. Victoria. We've got to be really strategic here. I mean, I'm over there like this week. I'll check it out. Check it out. Have a look. Uh, all right. Well, the next thing we like to do is uh, welcome a few people into the Triptych Club. This is the last thing we, we do in this section of the show. These people have been supporting the show for three straight years. Can you believe that, Dave? Three straight years. That is an incredible effort. And because of that, we induct them into a special club. Yeah. It's like a bit of theatre of the mind, as Matt says. It's a, it's a clubhouse. It's a bar. It's a, it's a treehouse if you want it to be. Treehouse Chris is there. Exactly. Treehouse Chris. He built it. Three stories. And he, he built it on meth. I just think, <laughs> it, <laughs> I think of it as an airport lounge. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. But like a nice one. A really nice Like a first one. class lounge. And it's got like really nice showers and like... You know, there's little rooms you can go have a, a sleep. That's oh. that's helped uh, paint the picture out a little bit in my head because I picture more like a Las Vegas lounge, you know, with booths yeah, and this sort of stuff. But yeah, now, yeah. now that I'm I'm sort of I like that better around a bit and saying, oh, there's showers, say, extra. Oh, there's an airport right there. Yeah, People yeah, are yeah. Flying from anywhere, you can come from anywhere. That's handy, absolutely. But instead of an airport, airport yes. it's a portal. You just step through it. Oh, wow. an air portal. An air portal. <laughs> wow. So, uh, normally what we do is I'm standing at the door. Uh, I've got the clipboard. I'm going to read out six names tonight. If you're, on, you're lucky enough to have your name read out, you step on through that... Air portal. Air portal. Uh, into the club. Uh, Dave's on stage. He will hype you up, get the crowd cheering your name. Uh, he'll also do some weak punnery on your name. I think that's what he does. And then Jess supports him because Dave doesn't believe in himself. Thank you so much. Uh, and Dave, you also normally book a band for the after party. Yeah, uh, you're never going to believe this. Who you got? I've got uh, the King of Soul himself, what? James Brown. Whoa. Who also happens to appear on the Apollo 13 soundtrack, but that's just a coincidence. Fuck, you're good. How do you do it? I don't know. I'm really, really good at booking. <laughs> just amazing. good at booking. You're good at admin. Godfather of Soul, is that what they call him? Sorry, called him King of Soul. But James Brown. An amazing wow, man. That's I, honestly, I put him up for a vote for before. I think he came second. I think one day he's I'll lived. He, well, he did live a, a wild yeah, life. wild life, incredible life. Hope to do a report on him one day. Cool. But before then, we're going to get him on stage, and he's going <sighs> to he's going to rock this club. Wow. Jess, you're normally behind the bar. You mm. normally make a, a cocktail in the name of the of the topic. What what's the Apollo thirteen cocktail? Involved? The Apollo thirteen. Um, obviously, I remember the the. R- Report we just heard. Yeah. Rocket very, fuel very well. It's probably involved. It's got rocket fu- fuel. It has uh, oxygen. Oh, yeah. But not much. <laughs> yeah, there wasn't much available. Not much oxygen. Just a little bit. Just enough. Um, oh, you've just set up a, a small oxygen bar. But instead of like plugging yeah. in, it's one quick shot. Yeah, you can have a shot of oxygen <laughs> and then keep partying. Yeah. And there's also snacks. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Are you ready, Dave, to welcome in some... I mean, they had limited snacks, so that's, that's probably good. I know, but I love how shit I've gotten at this. And Matt, every time, just goes, wow. wow. And then just moves on. Yeah, quite, I didn't hear what you said, but That's fantastic. amazing. Anyway, so every time, it's so sweet. Uh, all right. So, Dave, you ready? Here Jesse, we go. Let's, Jesse, you ready? Let's ready. welcome these go, people. Dave. They've been waiting three years. What They've been in line for three years, I presume. Right. What was I doing last week on an episode? I think I was just yelling at them. You're also putting your hand on my butt at some stage to give me support. No, but I was yelling something like, anyway, it doesn't matter. Oh, yes. What was that? I don't know. Let's see if it comes to you. Yeah. As we welcome in from Henderson in Nevada in the United States, it's Kelly Parish. Going to the parish and we're going to get Kelly. Uh, from Oldham. We in did not rehearse that. that. That's pretty good. Honestly, that was pretty good. <laughs> you just you knew I was going to say I Kelly. Knew. Thank I you knew. so much. From, uh, from Oldham in England, it's Paul Mellor. Paul Mellor. Better call Paul yes, Mellor. Yes, because he's the party. Woo! Great Saints supporter over there in Oldham Town. That's awesome. Uh, Dave, can you have a look at this next city? What's that say? Uh, uh, Volsio in Vol- Sweden? Volsio. From Volsio in Sweden, it's Kaya Warfinge. 
And I said, Kaya. Oh my God, yes. Kaya. I had no idea how you're going to pronounce that one, so I really had to wait till yeah. the pronunciation. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully we had a, a good crack there. Yeah, sorry. Someone mentioned in the in the Facebook group. Uh, that we ruined their day by r- saying. Were they like, oh, <laughs> they just said, ah, it's always interesting to see how Matt pronounces some European places and names. Uh, I'd also love to welcome in from San Bernardo. Dino in California <laughs> and American <laughs> influences. San Bernardino. San. <laughs> oh, whatever. Bernardino. Uh, it's Daniel B. Sawyer. Oh, more like Daniel B. Awesome. Yeah, let's party. Could he be any more Sawyer? Oh, fuck yes. From Bedale in Askew in Great Britain. It's Jamie. Cool. This night was going to go askew until you, Jamie, walked in. Yes. And finally from Tempe, Arizona. Owner in the United States, it's Adrian Hernandez Arista. Tempe. Going to the Tempe, Tempe and we're <laughs> going to get, get Adrian, Adrian Hernandez, Hernandez Arista. Arista. <laughs> Thank you and welcome <laughs> into the club, Adrian, Jamie, Daniel, Kaya, Paul, Kelly, Amanda, and no, Amanda was last week. <laughs> but, but Amanda's still here. <laughs> hey, hey, thanks for remaining in the club, Amanda. <laughs> Just run into Amanda at the bar. How are you? Oh, Amanda, you look great. <laughs> still mulling it over, Amanda Mullins. <laughs> Still got it. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the episode. Anything we need to tell people before we go, Jess? That you can suggest a topic at dogoonpod.com or there's a link in the show notes. Um, You can find live shows uh, and merch and all sorts of wonderful things over at dogoonpod.com. You can find us on socials at dogoonpod across everything. And uh, I think we're dogoonpodcast on TikTok, but we're... (laughs) prolific on there so <laughs> definitely rush to follow and uh we love you and dave boot at home hey we'll be back next week with another blockbuster special but until then also thank you so much and goodbye later bye Silly man.